Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. I got a little smile on my face because I'm really excited about this this episode. I have a, a good friend and a mentor, a trailblazer, who I'm, I'm trying to follow the footsteps of. I got Paul C. Maxwell, Dr. Paul C. Maxwell. And we're going to be talking about the problem of divine consciousness, which I believe was uh, his first academic article was was on this problem. So I'm super stoked about it. I, I made him do it. Uh, it was like this first thing way back in the day that he wrote, but I, I love the article. So I want to talk about it some more. Um, so let's just jump right in. Paul, thanks so much for coming on the podcast, man. What's up, man? It's an honor to be on. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Finally, I'm here. This is great. I love yeah, it. I love yeah. you. Man. I love Parker's Penn State. So I love what you're doing, man. It is Razor's Edge, live, real theology, talking mm -hmm. out loud. It's the way it should be done in my view. So congratulations on building such an authentic, you know, beautiful expression of what it means to do theology in real time, which I think we often miss out on, you know, and that's mm -hmm. kind of the exciting part. Yeah. Um, so I'm excited to be here really, you know, more than anything, man. So thanks for having me on. It's a big honor to be on the Parker Spence face, man. Dude, thanks, man. And, and I'm glad you like it because I, I have modeled a lot uh, off of what you do. And I, I meant to say this uh, in, the, in the opening, I got too excited, but you are you are like the Christian intellectual dark web. I know that that uh, that phrase is kind of passe now or whatever, but like if you were looking for it, folks, like it's here. He's on the podcast right now. And dude, I'm I'm encouraged because uh, you're kind of paving the way for like the plan B. Plan B in theology and philosophy and uh, academia is always kind of like, hey, you know, look for a plan B because there's no jobs. It's kind of like, dude, this sucks. Like I have to switch my degrees. I love doing what I'm studying. Mm -hmm. And you're here. All the professors are saying, get a plan B. And you're actually making like a live option where you're, yeah. you're you haven't punted on it. You haven't, no. you know, gone and, and become something else. You're like, I'm going to do this stuff. I'm going to teach people, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to dumb it down either. I love yep. that. Yeah, man. You know, I just, you know, this is the way I think about it. And everybody's so different, you know, and yep. what they do. And I think, I think that is so much the way to think about things is, you know, it's, it's about really preferences as much as it is about principles. Cause of course it's about, you know, theology and a, a education and what you learn is tied to what the truth is and what the truth is and how you get there has so much to do with whether you have the tools given to you that are appropriate to the task. And, yeah. you know, you see a lot of theological error with really smart people who are just maybe misusing the tool or maybe have the wrong tools. And, you know, e even that could even sound so arrogant to say. Right. Um, but of course, at some level, we, we all must resort to that kind of objective knowledge, just like another situation or rather objective way of speaking is what I meant to say. Yeah. But, you know, we all must resort to that objective way of speaking. But then, of course, there are other times where we must resort to the subjective side. And, you know, in, in reading Van Til, what I love about Van Til, um, I don't know. I don't know why people can't just appreciate what he does. Maybe he said too much for his own good. Maybe he was too smart for his own good. Maybe, yeah. I don't know what it was. Maybe he wasn't anything too much for his own good. Um, but, but, but the idea that really got crystallized for me in Lane Tipton's work on Van Til, which, you know, <clears throat> Like whether that's accurate or not, what it what it expressed to me was, you know, we've always been stuck and 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 um, in the West and Trinitarian theology, and even in the East and the West, you know, cosmologically, there's this ceiling on theology that is the one and the many, yeah, right. And we think of it as a philosophical problem. Christians, I think, who think deeply about that, think about it as a Trinitarian theological problem, even more deeply than it is a philosophical problem. Mm -hmm. And having that way of thinking, where Van Til's solution to that isn't to double down on the one, it's yeah. not to try to carve out a bigger footnote for the three in the in Western Trinitarianism. It's actually to say there is an equal ultimacy within our conception of the Trinity that can never let us reduce who the triune God is to monotheism or uh, some kind of uh, plur you know plurotheism on the other yeah. hand or, or or whatever it is but the sliding scale of unity and diversity of the one and the many you know we 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 get tired with that concept it feels so you know yeah 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 I get it the universal and the particular but yeah like we get it dude right but, but but the point isn't that those things exist which is a basic notion the point is that there are profound ways uh, or, or really better put would be profound profoundly successful angles of access to those realities that 
enable us to perceive something that wasn't always there. Hmm. Um, and 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 there are many limitations when it comes to doing theology correctly. And and on the one hand, those limitations are frustrating, just like any limitations are. You go to the gym, you go for your max, you fail, it sucks. You know, that's your limitation. And it, it's never fun to hit a limitation, but you know it's so good for you. You know yeah. when you hit that theological limitation, you're like, I'm coming back to the field the next day, hmm. training harder, getting stronger. And, and, and that's the journey of theology, because on the one hand, yeah, you, you hit those limits and it's hard. But on the other hand, man, jumping those hurdles, um, and, you know, I know I'm leaning heavily on a, athletic metaphors here, but, but, but it's, it's only because it's theology ought to be such an energetic work. It yeah. ought to be such, um, I don't want to say straining, but uh, it ought to be challenging. But, but on the other, but, but. Games with no rules don't mean any, the challenge isn't can't be conceived as meaningful. So why would I work hard to achieve it? So the promise of theology, what is the promise of theology? The promise of theology is that the challenge of theology is worth it, right? Mm -hmm. And and at the at the end of the day, before we even venture into the question of what we believe about a single thing, we have to, before we even decide about method, before we even talk about prolegomena, we have to say, do we believe from the outset? And this is a this is a you know this is not a synthetic a priori here. Mm -hmm. This is something we have to get from somewhere. But can we assume from the outset that the challenge of theology and the promise of theology is is made in good faith? Hmm. Does God make the promise of theology when He puts the challenge of it to us? Is that promise made in good faith? And every response we give to Him is an act of trust in His good faith. Yeah. Even when we're wrestling, even when we doubt, even all those things, every act of speech, every event of divine inquiry, um, it, it comes down to this. So, yeah. um, well, hey, man. <laughs> well, dude, I was going to hold the, the Van Til stuff a little bit. I I, uh, I remember when I first found found out that, that you had been interested in Van Til. I guess I should have known because I knew you went to Westminster. But I uh, you, you put out this um, this book. Uh, approaching divine light or something like that. And it's a collection of, of some of your published. Let's uh, not uh, yeah, let's not talk about that book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But that's how you found it. That's how you found it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that was awesome, man. Um, and then I I remember I remember seeing other people discover that you at least like Van Til, uh, mm. like Esther O'Reilly maybe on on Twitter and was like, you're you're a pre supper. I'm very disappointed in this. I was yeah, like, yeah. Oh no, people are finding out. But dude, that that brings me to the question: like, how did you ever get into theology at all? Yeah. You know, I was inflected into it. I, I, I mean, <laughs> there's this great scene in uh, season two of His Dark Materials, right? Where they're like, I won't spoil anything for anybody, but, you know, it's essentially one of the premises is that the crossing between two worlds and one of the worlds is, is like our world and the other world, you know, the, there's this thing that the, called the magisterium that rules and one of the biggest disciplines, you know, essentially instead of, well, they have scientists, but even more specialized in the sciences in that world, theology was preserved as the queen of the sciences. And so they're in their 21st century, but experimental theologians are one of them. It's one of the highest professions, highest status professions you can have. Wow. And so so one of their experimental theologians is, is, is crossing over talking to one of our scientists and uh and they're kind of like eyeing each other and uh and the you know the, the the scientist is like well what do you do and she's like well i'm a theologian and she's like what does physics have to do with theology and the and the and this experimental theologian says you know what doesn't physics have to do with <laughs> theology and and i love that because that's how and and in a way that exemplifies kind of how you know, I mean, hey, listen, the church basically owned the government of the West for a thousand years and we called it the Dark Ages. So I'm not necessarily optimistic that the <laughs> church being in charge of everything is always the best. But on the other hand, what I love about what is presented in that narrative is the idea of a world that did hold on to that and was positively shaped and maybe a, a, an aspect of depth was preserved in that. And and what I love about that is that's what it was. You know, like, how do you how do you cross that barrier between the two worlds of the physicist of our world and the experimental theologian of mm -hmm. the world in which theological pre presuppositions were culturally preserved, mm -hmm. you know, up through the 21st century? In that way, I don't know if I can explain why I love theology. I don't know if I explain why I got into it. In a way, I look at people who don't love it 
like the experimental theologian looks at the physicist, yeah. like what doesn't this have to do with literally everything? Yeah. Uh, and why shouldn't we be investigating these issues much more deeply and critically and hopefully excellently? And, you know, in principle, that's the purpose all these institutions are supposed to be functioning and or serving. And they do. You know, I was thinking about this the other day and I was thinking, I, you know, I went through these phases. People go through these phases where where they, they you know, Everybody always has problems with the church, but sometimes, you know, we come to express those things maybe more poignantly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I realized, you know what, man, for all the anger and resentment that, that sometimes bubbles up about some of the ways that I feel like I wish it was better or even was like egregiously hurt, I think, you know what, man? Like I look back at my pastor, you know, I'm 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 home in, uh, uh, you know, I'm back in my hometown now, just visiting really quick, and mm -hmm. I haven't visited my father's grave since he passed seven years ago, so I'm going to do that. But but being here, I see him, and I see the people who invested in me when I became a Christian at a Youth for Christ conference when I was 14, and I'm like, dude, you guys received something from one of my one of my people went to uh, my like my, my my pastor when I was a kid went to Capital Seminary, you know, and so I'm looking at these guys, I'm thinking. You guys gave me so much because you received so much. Mm -hmm. So as far as I am in Christian institutions, I think they play a vital role. But why I'm interested in theology really is because I had available to me people who had received depth and richness in training, exegetical linguistic training, systematic theological training. And they were able to showcase that to me as a young, young, young man, barely not even a child. Mm. And I think having the grace of being in the probably one church in upstate New York where I had access to people whose minds had been there, I could go there. I could kind of look down the cavern that they had dug and see the jewels there and then say, wow, you know, I don't know who else could maybe have the opportunity to see those things. And so when I go out into the world, I'm looking for those jewels too, because I find them to be precious. And that's all theology is, is it's look is searching for value. You know, we're all our own Indiana Jones of just looking for the, the the sacred artifacts of not only a objective history, but psychological history and and wanting to preserve them, you know, wanting to preserve, preserve them for the sake of truth, you know? Exactly. If that belongs in a museum, so do you, right? <laughs> just right. like, well, what is the museum? Because what is one of the most repeated commands in scripture? It's to remember. Mm -hmm. remember what? Remember the covenants, remember the faithfulness of God, remember the promises, the threats of God. And and that's what museums are for. They're for memory. They're for preserve. They're, they're they're for preserving not only what happened, but the perspective of those who uh, uh, effected what happened, so that we can not only understand the chain of events, but but the, but the momentum, the propulsion of history, objectively and subjectively. So theology for me is just always the deepest angle of access. It's always, in my mind, the pro most profound, comfortable angle of access. Now, you know, in, they, they, you know, people who learn to draw, you know, I'm I've been taking these drawing classes for about six months because I've always, I've always done digital graphic design, but, but, but really getting heavy into drawing. It's funny. I'm, there's this great program I actually started out with called Draw Box, not like an affiliate or sponsor. Yeah. But the idea is that you actually, all drawing is really just drawing one line, you know, mm -hmm. and then the better you get at drawing that. And I was really surprised that, the, you know, the neuromuscular uh, essentiality of physiology in, in, in drawing how, you know, I was drawing with my wrist and really, really good yeah. scapula because that's the highest radii. Yeah. Just all these things, you know, the way to draw the straightest line really comes drawing from your back. And I'm like, wow, all this stuff. That's theology too, man. It's drawing from the back and mm -hmm. not with the front. And, and what that means is that, you know, that angle of access, that one line that I'm drawing, you know, that's what theology is. It's the line I draw and I turn the page and I draw another line and I draw the same line over and over again. And then maybe one day I draw a line that's instead of 45 degrees, it's 44.9 degrees. And I get better at drawing 44.9 degree line, you know? And that's all theology is. We're just wedging our way into the divine. And, and the beauty of that, of course, is that we're not trespassing. You know, God's made this invitation by way of revelation without, you know, a world without revelations, inconceivable philosophically yeah. and theologically, of course. But but that doesn't that doesn't erase the question of hypothetically what it might be like to live in a world that you know magnifies or really like puts in your face the hiddenness of God. And the hiddenness of God, of course, is the mystifying aspect that 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 chases us all out of the village into the forest, you know, saying, run, run, uh, because this is all so complicated. 
You know, this is all so scary. These concepts are all so big. The smartest people in the world all hate each other because they all think these ideas mean different things. So what hope could I possibly ever have mm -hmm. having true knowledge of God? Because in a way, I felt that my academic journey into theology, which is, of course, always only about answering my own questions for myself, which I think people who've listened to me now maybe are tired of me talking about that. But, but, but you know, what, what, what theological education was for me what was was simply the venture of speaking truthfully about God for myself. I and and I always, you know, saw these people, you know, they 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 wanted to go into ministry, which I'm like, hey man, go uh, absolutely. Like you have a heart. I wish I had because what I received from people like you is immeasurably valuable. Mm. Um, but but uh, you know, why theology? I, it's all it's all I can see. It's all I can see, and mm. and that doesn't mean that uh, there was a time when it was all I could see in, in an unhealthy way. But, but when I think about theology, what I really think of is not the discipline, right? What I think of is the anchor. Um, and so and so in a way, theology is the it, theology isn't the queen of the sciences just because, <laughs> right? Yeah. It is its right and place, and that can't be divorced from its power and its function. and 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 what uh, the uh, one word that expresses all of that is fittingness. Mm -hmm. It is fitting for him to speak to us and it is fitting for us to respond and everything else in creation extends out from that and the beauty that we that we are able to access through following those lines of extension oh it we get lost in it yeah which is beauty it's it's what it's meant for we're meant to get lost in beauty because deep within getting lost in beauty we find god again he's everywhere as Bavink says and i think augustine you know he, he Bavink has his own twist i always forget who had the twist and who had the, like what was the twist was and what the original was but i know augustine said uh um you know god is more inward to us than we are to ourselves mm -hmm. and that's true of not only ourselves but objects which actually dovetails a little bit into this article doesn't it yeah um, and, but uh but, but you know, so what that means is that God is everywhere, which doesn't mean we always have to see God everywhere, which is, of course, the shortcoming of evangelical writing, right? Yeah. Six ways to see God and you're baking your apple pie for Thanksgiving. <laughs> right? Like, I'm just like, yeah, that's not really the God. I'm like, that's not the jewels. You know, when I think back to the jewels I saw as a young person that, cat, well, hey, man, I'm, 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 I'm trespassing on, uh, you know, uh, what's the word? I can't think of the word, but uh, uh, yeah, now, now, well, you know, the, the riches that I saw in uh, when I was young, which captivated me, totally captivated me. I, I just don't see that in what's being produced now. And I just wonder, like, why, why were two, why was a Moody grad and a Capital Seminary grad able to show me so many more riches than all the academic theologians of the world? Yeah. Why was that? I don't know. Yeah. I still don't know trying to figure it out um and in a way that's all i've been trying to do you know i i you know there's this great story of of the origin of the knights you know the the the, the classic knight's tale which is that of course the, it was the romantic sensibilities of the yep. roman empire c culturally you know homogenized with the barbaric sensibilities of the germanic tribes and from that you get this ethical warlord the knight yeah right? And that's who emerges from that. And in a way, that's the calling of the theologian is not to be a Roman soldier or to be a barbarian. Um, it's to be a knight. Uh, yeah. And of course, I'm, I'm leaning heavy into macho metaphors here, but but it's not, you know, these are themes. These are virtues. These are objective realities that have to terminate on one particular or another. So, yeah. you know, I'm speaking from my framework and that's what I have. Maybe I need to find a deeper well of metaphors sometime. But But that's how I make sense of it all. Why theology? Why reform theology? Why these issues? Because, you know, I look everywhere and you see gold and it's like, why aren't you focused on the, you know, everything else? Why aren't you focused on the apple tree? Maybe I'll get to the apple tree, but first I'm going to dig the gold that's like pouring out from the roots. <laughs> you know, I'm going to take that, put it in the bank. I'm going to come back. I'll buy a thousand apple trees, right? Yeah. And that's in a way, that's what theology does for you. If you can trust it, if you can take it to the bank, if you can let it appreciate and grow as an asset in your mind, as an epistemological asset in your mind, eventually it will come to give you so much more than whatever it is that we think uh, is deeper or better or superior. Sociology, linguistic hermeneutics, mm -hmm. continental philosophy, Heidegger's going to save theology, blah, 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 blah. Okay. I, yeah, I love Heidegger. I love him. I love Gödel. I love Frege. I love all of those guys. I, I learn from them. They make theology better in a thousand ways. But at the end of the day, it's just me and God. Hmm. 
And at the end of the day, when I'm laying in bed at night, I'm talking to him and I, I want to know who I'm talking to. Right. And that's what compelled me to study the Bible because I just wanted to know who I was talking to. And yeah. I still do. Dude, I love that. And so much of what you said resonates with me. Uh, the, the C.S. Lewis's essay, the the necessity of chivalry, and and we often use that. We often in evangelicalism think of C.S. Lewis as kind of this nice uncle, and yeah. in there he he's he talks about the knight being uh, accustomed to seeing smashed faces on the battlefield. <laughs> but then he can go and and dance with the lady at the ball. Of course, and he's like, dude, that's what I want. That's amazing. So I I love all those yeah. metaphors uh, as well. But um, dude, in in talking about theology, so much of what you talked about just reminded me of like I want. I want theology with teeth and I don't mean like, I don't want to be a jerk or anything like that. I just want something that's real that like, that is, it's like weaponized, you know, again, it sounds like a jerk, but teeth are, more, use. teeth are for more than biting my friend. They're for, yeah. you. you know, that's, that's so sharp teeth allow you to nourish yourself. Sharp teeth are an asset. You know, if you, if, if you, if you screw up your teeth, you're, you're screwing up your digestive system. You're screwing mm -hmm. up below that you want sharp teeth you always yeah. want sharp teeth and you want to chew it well which in my view is like you know doing all the research right yeah. but uh but yeah i i did i'm 100 percent with you on that 100 percent with you on that yeah well and and this is why uh i was so excited uh I'm, i am so excited about your work because it's like the kind of theology that so many of us are looking for what we turn to apologetics for and and it's really the, the theology and apologetics is usually pretty shallow or we go to uh, Christian philosophy, which, dude, I, I mean, most of my guests are Christian philosophers. I love them, but it's not quite as theologically rigorous as as you'd hope for, you know. Yeah. And it's it's the the prolegomena is a little bit more set towards philosophy, and that's okay because they're philosophers. But uh, you make theology exciting. There's there's a couple guys that I have in mind, and Van Hoos is one of them, right? Like yeah. the the Hoos is the man. Where it's like, the man. just keep talking, man. What 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 else you got in there? I want to know. I want that exploratory kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and this is this is what my next question for you. You you taught a course on philosophy. You have a um, a short little book, uh, Introduction to Philosophy. You speak about philosophy a lot. How did you not like get sucked into philosophy? Why 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 did you continue uh, with theology? And and what's maybe the relation in your mind between the two disciplines? Sure. Well, man, that's a great question. I just never. I in in a way, I like. I guess it was probably because I, you know, I was Scott Oliphant's research assistant at Westminster Theological Seminary, which was like one of the best like educational experience I've ever had in my life mm -hmm. was, and not just as his research, like just be uh, like a student, yeah. which, um, which I'll actually get to. He actually has a little bit to do with why this paper yeah. exists, which, which uh, we'll get to in a bit. But I think working with Scott was great. Because he was, you know, he was doing a lot of deep work in, I wouldn't even call it analytic philosophy. He was just doing his own thing. He was interacting with James Ross. He was interacting with these guys who were, you know, doing modal logic as metaphysics. And he was really trying to do redemptive historical hermeneutics with it to achieve some kind of, you know, more, sorry, my phone's ringing. Okay. So uh, sometimes, uh, um, some kind of conception of the ontology of God that was more credible, that was coming from Reformed theology that could actually speak into the analytic space. And yeah. of course, you know, we, you could say that people are doing that, but of course, when when you have people who are Vantilians who are who are doing work from that methodological perspective, sometimes they just like to have their own stamp on things. And yeah. honestly, that might have been the sensibility about Vantilians that kind of attracted me to them. Sometimes I like to put my little old, old stamp on things, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think Vantil likes to do that, and I think Vantilians like to put that little seal. Mm -hmm. And I think they should, because, you know, symbols are important. It's semiotics. It's half of linguistics, right? So, so you know, I think I think the work that Scott does and was doing is massively important, for the, massively important. In many ways, I, you know, I, I always looked upon the work of Scott in awe no matter what he was doing or saying or thinking, because that was a guy who really led, you know, he, he led with honest questions, but always, always pursued, you know, confessional adherence and always, always pursued, a, you know, a, a, a redemptive historical reform reading of the text. And you could just see what was really inspiring about, about working with Scott is that there, there just seemed to be a real psychological alignment between his disposition personally and the confession. And some, you know, I, I don't have that kind of alignment in me. So to see that and to study with him and to see somebody in practice doing, creating, building Christian orthodoxy in a way that totally just looked like it was totally fitting mm. to their sensibilities and disposition I'm, and, and in a totally positive way, you know, in a way that is, again, putting me in awe in many ways. 
um, that 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 was a signal flare for me. And I realized, you know, I like what this guy's doing. And then I saw what people were doing in philosophy, you know? And I'm like, do I want to do that hmm. really? You know, uh, and, and also how meaningful is it to be a philosophical generalist? It's hmm. not meaningful, really. I mean, you, I mean, it could be whatever you want it to be. You know, Jordan Peterson's like a philosophical generalist in a way, you know, so you yeah. can do a lot of powerful things being a philosophical generalist. But of course he borrows a lot from theology too, right? Which yeah. is I think the real, that and that, and the, the reason that I went the theology route over the philosophy route, and hey, man, maybe I'm just a sucker, but the the the, the theology promised me more. The mm -hmm. Theology promised me more. And and honestly, it, it, it came through. It yeah. came through. Because at the end of the day, I'm glad I'm not a phenomenologist, man. Yeah. I'm glad because 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 as soon as you and hey, the, not not that you can't be a reform Vantillian or not, not even that you should be a reform Vantillian, but not that you couldn't be a reform Vantillian PhD philosophy doing phenomenology or do continental philosophy and, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, but you can be you can be whoever you are doing that thing, yeah. which is the point. The point for me was I was on an educational track and my goal when I was training was to be a, a, a professor because. When I went to Moody, that put everything together for me. And I wanted yeah. to give that gift to other people. And I wanted to become whoever the best version of the person who's equipped to give that to 18, 19, 20, 21 year old Moody students who are gonna be unpacking that four years right. for the next 50 years of ministry, right? Um, I think, yeah, I wanted to, that, that's a meaningful work to me. That's a totally meaningful work to me because I know those students are gonna go out and be pastors and serve kids in bad situations like me, and they're gonna give them what I got. And the, the idea that I could play a hand in that, I just didn't really see philosophy giving me an, uh, you know, an entry point into that, even though my entry point into that actually was teaching philosophy. Right. Which, <laughs> right. yeah, it, was, it was more of an accident than anything. Yeah. But, of course, uh, but of course, I love philosophy, and, and it's for this reason, which I, I'm kind of, I don't mean to be like plowing through your questions, but of course it's all related. By the way, <laughs> interrupt me, be rude, be- <laughs> No worries, dude. But, you know, the role of philosophy in relation to theology is really, well, I actually, I think you did, you did ask this question. I yep. think you asked two questions, right? And so the role of philosophy in theology is like this. It's, um, I, I do believe theology is the queen of the sciences. And what that means to be, you know, uh, needs to be extrapolated and, and, and exposited, of course. Philosophy is like the nutritional fluid in the brain vat. Hmm. It, 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 it is the air that the disciplines breathe. And so I realized through doing my interdisciplinary discipline, or rather through doing my dissertation where I was, you know, I had an interdisciplinary task. What I discovered was that there's no such thing as an interdisciplinary task. No such thing. Hmm. There's only most basically the most simple. Oh no. As soon as I say this, your mind's going to go nuts. And I don't. <sighs> We're going to talk about triperspectivalism, aren't we? <laughs> so, uh, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I, I actually hope we do because every time I think about triperspectivalism, I'm like, dang it, that makes so much sense. Yeah, dude. <laughs> oh, but but uh, but but, uh, but really, what philosophy insists upon is always being the third voice in the conversation. It's always the translator. It's yeah. always the translator. That's philosophy, which is why I think it's really important that theologians become as great of philosophers as they possibly possibly can, because yeah. philosophy is not just another discipline right. in the book stack. Philosophy is the book stack. Yeah. yeah. Theology might be the library. I, you know, however you want to cut the metaphor, I mm -hmm. think theology is bigger than philosophy. I do. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms, not, not, I mean, not in terms of the, the, the material produced in terms of the, of the scope of their respective domains is what I mean. That is yeah. So, um, so philosophy is the connective tissue. If theology is the bicep, you know, the, the, uh, philosophy is the elbow. Hmm. Philosophy is the joint. Philosophy yeah. is the is is the fulcrum for every interdisciplinary endeavor, and every endeavor is an interdisciplinary endeavor. Yeah, and 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 um, that doesn't make them parasitic. It just means rationality is probably closer to something like what W. V. Quine said than what Aristotle said in terms of what is rationality. Well, um, well, well, even that is something that you would have to break down because. What Aristotle does is gives us a set of tools for something that works a certain way. Mm -hmm. Quine gives us a set of tools that work for something else a different way. They just happen to call it the same thing, which is why they're often artificially put into competition. But I love the Quinean web. I love the idea that things are reconfigured directionally, extensively, geographically in a web, you know, rather merely than and essentially what was an ancient, ancient version of like a markdown app or something like that. And so um, I, I think 
you know, what we're doing with philosophy is we, we, when you introduce philosophy into theology, you're fulcrumizing your theology and thereby functionalizing your theology. Yeah. So, so in a, in a way, theology is impotent until it comes into contact with philosophy. And it, philosophy is the antidote to the impracticality of theological theory. And um, there are many antidotes. Real, real life is an antidote to the impracticality of theological theory. That's right. true, man. There's a million solutions. And, and the impracticality, there's everything's impractical. Every theory is impractical. It's not like theology is just especially impractical. Right. It's that all theory requires work to be put into practice, not just work in regards to the act, but works in regards to the intellect as well, right? Yeah. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the promise of philosophy. And actually, I think if we think of these disciplines as mutual systems of, of, of obligation outwardly toward one another, and not, not only obligation, but dependence, right? It's an ecosystem of in, interdependent groups of people uh, inquiring, uh, inquiring, hopefully, into the truth. But, the, but theology promises us that the challenge that it poses to us is worth it if we succeed. Yeah. What philosophy does is actually not promise us anything. Philosophy doesn't make a promise to us. Philosophy makes a promise to theology. And as theologians, then once we trust God or once we trust the good faith offer of theology or rather God's good, the, 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 the good faith nature of God's offer uh, of a promise of theology, uh, but philosophy makes the promise to theology. Mm. And so as vice gerents thereof, we then have to, on God's behalf, decide what works and what doesn't work, what fits and what doesn't fit. And uh, there's a lot of weight on your shoulders, which is why a lot of people feel that the solution to bearing that weight is to just double down on foundation, going to build a wide foundation. We're going to build a confession. We're going to build a catechism. We're going to build you know, everything. Um, and so, and that's not always the wrong solution, um, you know, but there are other solutions too. And the weight of theology, sometimes what it does, and sometimes some people do this, I try to do this, but I probably don't even do this as much as I think I do. I probably have an inflated view of myself, but, but, but what I try to do is I, ju I just try to hold it, man. Just try to like military press it, you know? And I try to I try to hold it, and I try to say, what can I do with this? What can I do with this? Where can I go with it? Where can I put it? What 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 operations does this make available to me? What is it? And if if you can stand under the weight of the problems of theology long enough, I think the reward is understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's scary. And the reason it's scary is because, you know, why don't we feel this way about philosophy necessarily? Why don't um, and philosophers, you know, wh wh where is the boundary line? Philosophers are always changing their views on stuff, right? Yeah. I'm mean, thinking that, right? Yeah. Some of them, do, some of them don't. Yeah. What's this? What's this? It's the mental breakdown. <laughs> right. Yeah. What's that border? It's the God question mm. every time. Every time. Yeah. Right. And so, so, but here's the thing, you know, philosophers over here doing this thing, you know, changing their views. We're over here, man. Yeah, we're, we're living in chaos. We are living in a high stakes environment over here in theology land. Yeah, stakes are enormously high. Yeah, the the, the truthfulness of the story I've told myself about myself for like for, for forever is like on the line here. Yeah. Um, and of course, I don't think that's a healthy way to do theology. I think um, we have to be invested in it, and I think we have to feel the weight, the significance, the consequences. But we also have to find that balance where we say, I feel the weight of theology. I trust the good faith offer of God, which he's making through theology when he poses the challenge of its obstacles to me. Theology is always a hero's journey. Mm -hmm. and when I embrace that, I say, the only way I'm gonna survive, and again, this isn't true for everybody. I know guys that do the confessional thing and they love it. And I'm like, dude, I would never want you to leave that ever, 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 ever. You're perfect for it. Um, and not in a bad way, right? Like that you're right. Right. Or like what you believe, all that stuff. For me, I want, to, I. I I want to solve the problem. Hmm. I want to know because at the end of the day, you know, I think it was Hudson Taylor who has this great thing, you know, this great quote, a man is who he is on his knees before God and no more. Yeah. That's a scary thing. I don't like that. I, I had this feeling last night. I looked out, I saw the trees. I was like, ah! I was like, God's real. Ah! Yeah. And I was like, that's it. That's like, oh, wait. Ah! You know, it's like that moment. Yeah. That that quote is so much more epic than than we let on in in our Christian circles. Like that that's like a terrifying, holy crap! There's a God, and he's not an old man. 
Yeah. And he's not young. He just yeah. is. And like oh, thinking about that, I was like, dude, that guy's freaking like, I bet you like he loves coming to earth jacked. You know, like when he came to Angel of the Lord to wrestle Jacob, I bet right. he was like Brandon Schaub. What's up, bro? You know? um, <laughs> right. uh, yeah. But no, totally. Right. There is a virility, mm -hmm. a virility to God. Yeah. We cannot neglect. A hundred percent. We miss it. We miss and it. It's terrifying. Yeah. Like when you think about that, it's just me and God. And it's like, oh, just me and God. It's a country song. It's like, dude, it's just you and God. It's more like a wrestling match, more like jujitsu. Yeah. And it's just you. No one can help you. It's just you and him. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's one of those journeys you just never want to walk on. And it's one of those getting pushed out of the nest things. Like, here's the thing, man. If we don't jump out of the nest, life will push us out of the nest. Yeah. And, if, and if we try to create a nest on our way down, it's going to blow up. And so mm -hmm. the only way is to face God and say, these questions are mine. The solutions are mine. When I find an answer to a theological question that bothers me, I accept it with full acknowledgement that I may hold a different position in a year. Yeah. And that's okay. That doesn't that doesn't denigrate the significance or the function or the gap that that concept fills for me theologically now, right? The f because here's the thing: most people go through their lives. Some people don't, but so most people go through their lives, believe five completely different contradictory things about the same issue over the course of their lives, mm -hmm. and because of the slowness of change in human preference, it appears to us that we were equally reasonable. All yeah. along. <clears throat> and is it possible for us to be equally reasonable across multiple points of time and yet at the same time consider ourselves to have been increasingly rational? Mm. Is that possible? Mm. And 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 actually, we must accept that it's possible. We must accept because we that's what we in that's what we presume. We have to yeah. presume it. We have to presume that, well. Maybe I wasn't as right as I am 20 years ago, but I was certainly as reasonable. I was pursuing the same ideal. I had that great same fire of spirit of pursuing truth of just wanting to know and wanting to be a good person and, and wanting to accept the grace of God however it was fitting to be accepted. Yeah. You know God however however it was fitting to know him. And, 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 and over the course of that time, I've gotten here. And we must not merely accept that, um, that that is true. We, we must insist upon it. Uh, you know, we, we have to like Michael Scott declare it, you know, <laughs> right. we have to declare that we have been equally reasonable this whole time. And if we don't do that, we will be trapped, always trapped by the critique of our future selves. And that that is a weight God doesn't call us to bear. Yeah. And so that is the epistemological Chinese finger trap. A lot of people get stuck in is they're like, D -d 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 I can't. But it's what if it's what if it's what if it's what if it's right? That's 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 the trap. Yeah. Right. Where you say, listen, you know, I trust the reasonableness of myself and the grace of God to me, who gives me reason, who gave me revelation, who who is not a divine trickster. He's not. A, he's not Loki. He's not. A, you know, he's not any of those guys. But, you know, he's especially not Loki. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah as, as, as Paul says to Titus and Titus one to God who cannot lie, mm. cannot lie, um, uh, which is a beautiful oh, man. How packed is that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That God cannot lie, and and so what I love about that is God really gives us the gift of of saying that first of all the matter of doing theology, and this is what Van Til says, and this is why I love Van Til because it's a, it, the one thing I would change about Van Til is when he says like, oh, I disagree with autonomy in all of its senses. Yeah. Really, really, like 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 you never asked for more professional autonomy at Westminster mm -hmm. ever. Really, I feel like you maybe kind of are into autonomy, Van Til, especially because you're kind of your own weird dude, right? Yeah, creative theology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course, nobody means metaphysical autonomy. Right. I'm metaphysically autonomous. You know, I'm like the Silver Surfer from Fantastic Four. I'm so you know existent, right? Like, hey, man, no, you can't say that. Yeah, nobody's saying that. Right. Nobody's saying that. Nobody even needs the critique of autonomy. It's like, yeah, I'm I'm metaphysically self dependent. You know, yeah. Uh, no, nobody's saying that. So we don't need the critique. We don't need to jettison the word because nobody uses it in that stupid way anyway. Right. right. Um, uh, and so, so you know, practically they may presume these kinds of things ethically. Right. But that's the point that I'm getting to about why Van Til is valuable. Mm -hmm. He starts with ethics. He starts with ethics every time. Yeah. And of course that gets overplayed and get, gets pushed and narrowed into this idea of militant theology, right? The antithesis, yep. red and blue, black and white, you know, uh, good spy, bad spy. 
Um, and that's how we do theology. That's how we do this. And for Van Til, I think it was more um, generic than that. And in that regard, richer than that. Uh, mm -hmm. Because when he was talking about the antithesis, yeah, it, antithetical, antipathy, there is a sense in which, of course, man, you know, man, man and God are in ethical antithesis through the story of redemptive history in principle, through their covenant representatives and in through the particular practices of sinfulness and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, like yada, yada, yada. Again, nobody's questioning that. Reformed people spend so much time like explaining things that nobody like is saying. But, um, but, but, but what that does for us ethically is to say theology is first and foremost, because it's the queen of sciences is where we start. And it's also, so it's the queen of the sciences is where we start, but then where do we start where we start? Well, where do we start starting? And, and wh where we start starting theology is ethics. And what that means is, well, where do you start starting starting? It's the conscience, it's the conscience. Mm. Um, and so at the end of the day, if anybody ever tells you that they have anything more to certify their theological opinions than their conscience. They're lying to you. They're lying. Now, the conscience is is an extra is a fundamentally extrospective, you know, operation of the mind. So yeah. we can't have a conscience with regard merely to ourselves. Yeah. Everything yeah, right. about how the conscience works and ought to work is always about how it interfaces with right. objects. And even more than that, how those objects insist upon being treated by the conscience, right? Yeah. Because that's important too. Creation comes with its own rules. And that, you know, that's probably the you know, source of all pain in the world is that we were not willing, you know, we're not willing to accept that. Really, really, pain is a measurement of our willingness to accept our circumstances in the moment. Yeah over time well dude that that's so helpful because it's not you're not just like locked into a, a solipsism that's not what you're saying you're saying no no like the conscience is like necessarily interlocked with other subjects and with other objects and now you have this deal of how should i deal with that i bumped into someone instantly now what do i do and you know, how I, do i sit on the chair whatever again where van Til comes in what how do we like you just said right how do we normally think of our conscience well it's a private operation of the yeah. mind equal ultimacy bro Van Til, it's an equally private and public operation of the mind. If your conscience merely operates privately, you are operating solipsistically, at least yeah. practically speaking. But it, and 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 so this is what I love about like guys like Carl Truman, right? Guys like Carl Truman, like back in the day when he was like, you know, kind of teaching, you know, schooling evangelicals on kind of confessionalism. And one of the reasons you need a confession is so that like what you believe can be open to public critique, right? That's what's right. so important about it. Because if you just say, well, I don't have a confession, all that means is that you're keeping your confession secret from everybody else. So, so that's the public exercise of the conscience. Now, that doesn't mean that to exercise the conscience publicly, you have to be a confessionalist. Sure. That's how one group of people chooses to publicly exercise the conscience. Um, there are many other ways to do it, but the important thing is that it's something outside yourself. You know, it's something that is really should happen liturgically, should happen relationally. But at the end of the day, I want people to know exactly what I believe, which is why I don't believe I'm going to fit at a seminary or a Bible college as a faculty, because I don't want to pretend that I'm comfortable with things or uncomfortable with things that I'm not, you know? Um, why would I do that? Why would I sign up for something like that? The only reason I would is if I felt that my sensibilities were so aligned, like some of these great professors who do these things, yeah. you know? Um, and and, and that's, that's why I think it's so great. But then you come back to theologians like Donald McKinnon at mm -hmm. Cambridge, who's one of my favorite theologians. His whole thing was like, hey, you, you guys are, and, and, and McKinnon had a really important role to play in, in, in the Anglican response to, to the nuclear hog, or, or, or rather the use of nuclear weapons. And I think he, he, he helped the parliament to pen that in 1962. So this is an important person. Yeah. Uh, Donald McKinnon. Um, and so, you know, he has this uh, great book called Theology and the Burden of Philos uh No, it's called Philosophy and the Burden of Theological Honesty. Mm -hmm. And that notion of theological honesty from the 60s from a Cambridge dude who, dude, look at look, look this guy up. He looks exactly like Jackie Gleason. So funny. Um, but, but, uh, but, you know, Donald McKinnon is fantastic. But what he said was that you guys are so obsessed with like the pastor scholar. Yeah. Pastor scholars can't ask the important questions. They do the important work. They teach the second graders the theological grammar. It's all cool, but we want to be astronauts, and to be astronauts, you got to get out of the atmosphere. To get out of the atmosphere, you know, I'm 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 I'm, I'm breaking the metaphors, but you got to crack a few eggs. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, there you go. To finish the metaphor, but yeah. uh, but but the point is, it's hard. 
but we have to leave. And the only way you can leave is if you commission the laity to do so. And he was a commissioned Anglican lay theologian. Bro, yeah. that's what we're missing. That's yeah. the office we're missing, is yeah. the commissioned lay theologian, because they are at, able to ask para-confessional questions. Yeah. And, and hey, I, th I mean, these are the men of the wall, right? These are the men of the watch. That's what they do. They stand on the wall and they watch. And, and they send a look. That's so good. And and I've noticed too, they have they have different questions and they have authentic yeah. questions. And they say, you know, what about this? Can I do this? Should mm -hmm. I do this? How should I think about this? And it's like well, that's not interesting. No, that is interesting. That's what all the men are asking about. That's very, very interesting. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. No, it's there's a big, I mean, there's a cultural split, right? I mean, the kinds of guys that become professors in these places are training people to minister to people that they really don't understand, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not like a cataclysmic problem because somewhere along the way, I think people kind of figure it out, right? Which is why we have so many great churches and pastors. Like eventually along the way, people figure it out. And that's right. fine, right? Like you can't, like if you go through seminary and then you suck as a pastor, it's like, you can't just blame the seminary, right? At some point it's on us. To do yeah, there's personality in there, there's life experience, yeah. Yeah, like I honestly, dude, I probably could have not not gone to a reform center. I, I probably could have gone to like Alliance Seminary and be, got just as much out of it because I know I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna do all right. what I'm gonna do anyway. Right. And and that's the attitude theologians need to have more. Uh is that attitude that go getter it's it's not about go getter attitude, like go getter, like write more, right, right, right. It's about go getter in terms of like, man, that meal did not satisfy me. That you know, when I'm reading this argument about theodicy, mm -mm, there was just not enough protein in that meal. I'm sorry. Uh, and and that's what we have to do is we have to be brave enough not to be satisfied mm. and because because there's safety in being satisfied. Of course, I want to be satisfied. Look at mm. look at that argument. Look, it's so satisfying, isn't it? I can I just point people to it, right? I don't have to. Oh, I don't have to. Thank yeah. God. It's uh, so, so, so satisfying. Yeah. Thank, thank the Lord. Whew, on to the next question. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's the uh, who's, spam. Get off your spam. This is Parker Spence's. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, man, I'm blabbering, bro. I'm no, blabbering. this is good, man. This, this, it all, it all sets up um, exactly what I wanted to, to, to dive into your article because yeah, um, I like, I like, uh, I like theology as the queen of the sciences. Gray Sutanto in his uh, recent book on Bavink, mm -hmm. he, uh, he, he couches mm -hmm. that as like uh, a servant queen. She's a servant queen and she's helping out. I, I love our conversation about philosophy and it seems like there's not very many limiting concepts. You can be all sorts mm -hmm. of stuff in, the, in philosophy. There's some limiting concepts in theology. And so yes. I think what, what's so cool about your article here is that it's in this, this uh, philosophy journal, but th there's this problem of divine consciousness that Matt McCormick brings up. And uh, I think his essay is why God cannot think. And he advances this, th this uh, philosophical critique a la Kant and it's against the doctrine of uh, omnipresence and then, you know, God's uh, ability to think. And instead of cutting corners and just accepting the premises and saying, well, how let's redefine our theology proper and we'll, we'll reconceive of God. You just dive in deeper into theology and mm -hmm. say, no, 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 the answer is actually back in theology. I'm not cutting corners and then playing your philosophical games. Yeah, I'm, I'm going in deep to show you a rich theological answer that satisfies your philosophical um, critique or concerns. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I love. And I love even more because you use Van Til. Mm -hmm. You use Van Til in a different way than saying, oh, I'm pushing the antithesis or, you know, right. by the, necess you know, the uh, impossibility of the contrary. You know, right. it's like, no, you're using Van Til's theology to answer right. philosophy. Because the classic presuppositional critique of McCormick is you get your categories from Kant. Kant was wrong about everything because he was a freaking moron because obviously I'm smarter than Kant. And uh, therefore, your argument's invalid, right? That's the classic presupposition. Yeah. We even get it, like, yeah, like, do you even source your epistemological yeah. principles from anywhere, right? Like, that's it's just copy and paste. A yep. question, and uh, you know, it's the laziest thing in the world. Somebody just reviewed my book and gave that essential argument. I'm like, fantastic, fantastic <laughs> move. Uh, uh, what is it? Outstanding move. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but but you know, it's it's. Um, you know, I actually lost what where we were. Where were oh, we're, so we can just jump in on the, the problem of divine oh, consciousness. Yeah. We're talking about, yeah. we're talking about so, until and the critique. Yeah. Yeah. I have a little bit of a funny story about this article. So, yeah. so probably 
500 versions of this article exist out there somewhere by other people. Yep. Um, oh, do you know the story? Well, I put it together myself. I've listened to uh, Scott Oliphant's uh, intro to Precept or oh, Theology oh, One okay. or something. And he was talking about this and I sent you a message back in the day. Oh. Uh, I, was, I figured it out because I'm a, a nerd and I follow the, the lines, but I'll let you tell of it. Course. Of course. Yeah. No. So, yeah. So, so, you know, of course the story is that, uh, you know, Scott, you know, hands us this book or, you know, assigns us this book in class and, and that's our final paper in apologetics 101 in Westminster is to pick an article in this book and, uh, you know, give a, give your best, uh, response to it apologetically building on some of the principles we learned in, in his class, which was, uh, you know, I'd highly commend that class. I mean, Scott's a fantastic educator. Um, so, so learning apologetics from him, very balanced, very informed. He's got, Man, he's just got he's he's got these ways of thinking that are just very pedagogically useful. So mm -hmm. yeah, he he was a great teacher. But so so I did. So you know, so I, I, this was an assignment for me, and then um, I sent it to Matt. You know, I sent it to Matt McCormick, and I was like, you know, I would love your feedback on this, quite honestly, because you know, I know I know for the four hundred ninety nine other people really don't care, um, but I do because I want to know. Like, does this work? And he was like, you know, this is pretty good. He was like, you should get this. You should you should publish. You know, so his you know his uh, the article I was I was responding to was in the book, but his original article was in Philo. So I thought Philo would, you know, which is the the publication of the Council for Secular Humanism at Purdue, which I, I think might not exist anymore. Yeah, I think it's out since twenty fourteen or something. Yeah, right. So yeah, a guy snuck in there, squeaked in at the end. But uh, but but yeah. So so he was like, yeah, man, you should you should publish this in Philo. And then Philo actually rejected it, and mm -hmm. and um, and then they got a new editor, and then he emailed me back like six months after they rejected it, and he was like you know what i actually love this article and I, he was like can we publish it i was like yeah, yeah sure man <laughs> I like it. so so yeah we did it and in a way i wasn't even trying to get published but doing that was great i received no feedback you know the only person who gave me feedback was grace utanto he's like this is the article this is great all um, right uh, yeah and i was like thanks great um <laughs> but uh but yeah, so th this was a fun article because for me, this was like very much kind of the blocking and tackling of presuppositionalism of like, all right, we're going to do some defense, but we're also going to do some constructive work. Yes. Right? So, and I think there should always be that proportion. I think you, you're, 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 there's no rule, right? But I think, I think generally like maybe not in each piece, but in your life. Yeah. Doing 80% deconstruction of secular worldviews and 20% constructive work. I think Vince Hill would have a problem with that because- for Van Til, and you get this, I actually got this most, first of all, from reading just his very, you know, brief Christian apologetics book. Mm -hmm. um, but then more deeply, when I really, he exposits this out, is in his introduction to systematic theology work, which he basically says, systematic theology is apologetics, actually. Yeah. Because what you do is you just eliminate like 90% of the questions as misconceptions, as true logical misconceptions of what they're critiquing. And so all you have to do to respond, you know, all these secularists have just got these M16s like, <laughs> going at Christianity and Van Til's just like, boop, and just like, <laughs> pops the balloon, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and and because that's all he has to do, and and what I love about that, it's it's you know going back to your metaphor before, it's like jujitsu in the sense that you know it's it's really about fulcrumizing your theology, right? Going back to the fulcrum, yeah. the, the role of philosophy is as the fulcrum. So it's not so much about obliterating or steamroll. I don't really want to steamroll. What can you do after you steamroll somebody? You just you know wash it off with a hose. But but when you have that 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 pressure point where you only have to apply so many pounds of pressure to get an, a significant, more, much higher ROI, yeah. theologically speaking, apologetically speaking. And you know, that's what I'm going for at all times. I want the most, this is what we're missing right now, um, because we look at these apologetics books, right? Who can read them? Who could read all the, you know, the number of apologetics books? Um, um, and, and what are they doing, dude? It's like, it's like they're all doing like 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 you know bendy curls in the gym they're like <gasps> yeah <gasps> you know yeah. And what it what what it really is is you don't need to do all that bro you could just do a little like boop. you could just yeah. do a little bit like you could do a little bit and um and that's all apologetics needs so i think the real the the elegance of apologetics really expresses itself in the smallness of apologetics mm -hmm. right that ventilian like that's all you need. And so that's what I try to do in this article. I try to just say, could I solve this whole critique 
with like one idea, right? And, and, and an idea that's not original to me, because again, this comes back to Quine's web, right? And, and, and if, you, if, you, if you engage McCormick's Kantian critique of the idea of divine consciousness, which is simply that, uh, you know, according to human Kantian, you know, I, I'm not even going to put it the way he puts it. I'm going to explain it to regular people. Yeah. McCormick's critique is essentially this. God couldn't exist because the idea of God and a divine mind couldn't be conscious. Let me tell you why. As humans, we look out into the world. And I could maybe see my hand. Wow, that's amazing. And then I could maybe look at this table and see that table. Wow, that's amazing. It's a table. The only way I'm able to do that is because there's a difference between me and that. And that difference is constituted on the basis of location. Or it's, it's a locative differentiation, which is, of course, a matter of presence. And so with God knowing all things exhaustively and being present to all things exhaustively and extensively and immediately makes the phenomenon of divine consciousness impossible. Mm -hmm. He can't um, make the subject object distinction because he's everywhere and knows right. everything. Right. Yeah. It's like, hi, I know you. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, it's, yeah. It, right. No. He, right. And that's the critique, right? Is, is God just got his face smashed against the zoom camera uh, and, and obviously couldn't see anything at that point of all things, you know? And, um, and, 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 you know, I try to solve that by essentially saying like, yeah, if the ceilings creation, you're going to be looking at God the way a, a, a fish looks at a human up through the water, looking down on them. We're That's good. Like, oh, that guy's face takes up the whole surface of the water. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, he's actually above the water and he's looking down and he's, you so know, good. he does feeding you. And we're like, flakes are falling from his face. No, he's just feeding you fish flakes. Um, you know, and so phenomenologically, that's that's the essential weakness of McCormick's view is that he insists upon con uh, he insists upon you know, taking for granted his conception of what God appears to be as the Christian doctrine of God, which, of course, when you look at the Christian doctrine of God, you, it's confusing, man. Like you can't dock McCormick too much. Where do you start? How? Who? Who says what? Where? When? Yeah, a million things, a million places, right, a million right. people. So somebody like McCormick, who's interested in engaging the question of God, and I like, like, like that's what I love about Matt is like he clearly wants to like figure it out, and 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 that's what I love even so much about philosophers is a lot of these, you know, nobody, people can become theologians because of cultural Christianity, yeah. but there's no version of cultural Christianity like for philosophy. Usually, people that end up in philosophy are there because they're yeah they really want to be there, and Matt yeah. clearly is one of those very capable. Uh, very intelligent, but also very eager guys who clearly has a heart and a, and a mind for seeking truth. And so so that's what I love about it. But on the other hand, he just doesn't see it because he doesn't have access to revelation. And that's yeah. the only reason I can see it. I'm not better right. than him. I'm some thousand times dumber than Matt McCormick. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that's where grace comes in. And of course, that pushes us into Kierkegaard and Schleiermacher and Fideism and all the uncomfortable, mushy, gushy stuff. And that's fine. And, and I think I think we have to I think we have to have that stuff. I think we have to listen to Kierkegaard uh, uh, and Schleiermacher and, and modern theology and all those guys because, you know, they inform the story. But, uh, you know, from there, what I say is essentially, yeah, you've got lower consciousness, you've got higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. These are various ways of manifesting uh, sentience in the world relative to various objects. But then, then, then uh, yeah, so McCormick says, well, God can't have higher consciousness because he can't make the subject object distinction. And I say, well, it's not as simple as him having high, higher consciousness. It's a, it, it's a matter of him having a consciousness which actually is directionally opposed and inversed on the other side. So in, in a way, God's, um, God's existence and his relationship to creation is actually the analog upon which we are based, right? Yeah. So, Tempted to say, well, God's just the mirror opposite of us. No, no, no. We're the mirror opposite of Him. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and not not to say that you know. Of course, we're in His image and likeness. But but to say in terms of the processio of the mind's operations relative to the processio of the divine mind's operations and His economy and is relating to creation, they're they're they're, they're category. You know, it's a merism. It's a it's a it's a chiasm, right? Is what yeah. you would call it. And 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 the 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 peak of the chiasm would be creation itself it would be the, the the encounter of divine and human together uh, uh and that and that's the peak and then from there you get a mirroring of operations and so what mccormick sees is he sees he's i'm trying to think how, how does this hmm. okay so i'm trying to think of, no i'm going the wrong way okay so i'm trying to find my hand okay so 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 mccormick 
thinks about it like this. Why is this so hard for me? I'm like, dumb. Um, so, so McCormick, he sees it like this. Yeah. We're looking up at God. We're looking higher consciousness, higher, 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 higher. God, God's highest consciousness gets stuck. He can't make the subject object distinction. He can't do it. He can't jump the bar. He can't justify how he could know all things and be present to all things simultaneously, thereby having what he calls omniconsciousness, which is merely having omniscience and omnipresence at the same time. Yeah. He can't have it. He can't have it. And of course, the way out of that, oh God, now I gotta get there again. So now the way out of that is, of course, is to say, man, mind's operation is going like this. It's the ceiling here, and then God's operations take over, right? And and that is the analog. That is the trajectory. That's the water slide that comes down, hits the terminal point of creation itself. That's the contact point between the anti that's so that's the contact point of the antithesis, right? Yeah. Uh, how often do, do people say, as far as the east is from the west? Yeah. Well, they actually touch each other, so they're not very far at all. It's the same thing with with, with the antithesis, right? How far is God from humankind? Well, very far. And and also not far at all. Yeah. And so and 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 taking into account how God relates to creation takes not only into account how He works and how we work, but how we are both far and far from and near to Him at the same time. We are far from Him not only in our operations in terms of the way we see things, right? The processio of our mind has to begin with phenomena in the opposite direction of God, right? Yes. We, yes. At, at, we begin with the particular, we begin with a totally zipped file, right? It's zipped up, zipped as tight as they get. And then by, as the, by the time it gets to us, it's unzipped. And we're like, okay, I see it. And what do we have at that point? We have ideas which correspond to what? Divine exemplars. And for God, it starts with the exemplars, makes it the, the, to the particular via the, the covenant of redemption, the, the decree of creation, or however you want to slice that pie, you know, super lapsarianism or infralapsarianism mm -hmm. or whatever. And then, you know, it finally gets to reality, right? Mm -hmm. Human recreated reality, contingent reality. And from there, we essentially fall back into the divine processio backwards. And we, we, do, a tr uh, we do an epistemological trust fall with God, which yeah. is what that is. Well, dude, this is, this is what's so helpful. Um, so you, you bring up uh, representations, and I think that that's helpful language. So we have an object, and we have uh, our conception. We have representations of these objects. And McCormick is like, God can't do this. And you're saying, well, no, God God is the original. God's representations are where we get objects from in the first place. And that's how that's this mirror image. God has representations. He makes objects. We are here, and we see the objects, and we make representations. And and you call this uh, pro phenomenal knowledge, or yeah, we have like phenomenal knowledge, knowledge, right? Like we have our phenomena, and we we are coming to things, we're making representations of them. God is this pro, this proto, this like beforehand. He made the objects from his ideas and his concept. Yeah. Yes, yeah, and you know, um, uh, oh, what's there's a great article on this in the Westminster Theological Journal. Journal. I should remember it. Scott will be upset for me for not remembering the name of this article, but no, he won't. He's the next guy. But uh, um, it's it's on it's on the distinction. It's it's a it's really just a great explanation of the distinction between archetypal and ectypal theology, yeah. and um, and those are confusing concepts, right? Especially when you've got like archetypal, ectypal, ontological, economic. Yep. Yeah, you've got a ton of distinctions about God functioning all at the same time that all seem to be about necessity and contingency somehow. And like, you know, I, I still kind of, I, that's actually one of the things I think I need to do really soon is kind of split up a taxonomy of that. I'm sure it's there. I'm sure it's in Muller and, and, and all these guys, but I just have to find it and put pieces together. But, but yes, that's what, that's, that, that's McCormick's essential critique. And what I say is that pro phenomenal, not, you know, cause what is phenomenal not Phenom the, the, it comes from the Kantian distinction. So should I explain Kant for your readers? Yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. You know, so the whole history, well, <laughs> I was about to like, rewind way too far. So well, let's just start with Descartes. How's that? Yeah. So, so uh, you know, um, well, let's start with Thomas. I, I am not that good. So Thomas, you know, believes that that essences uh, are what constitutes objects, right? So if I look at a table, it's a table because it has the essence of a table. And I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a human because I have the essence of a human. Or, or what he, he makes this distinction in Latin, of course, between ends and essay, which is being and existence, being is the noun, essay is the verb, yeah. right? Uh, uh, and so uh, when, when, we, when we have an essence, there's a realist aspect to that in the sense that there's a givenness. The, the, um, 
phenomenology doesn't have to be important to Thomism. It doesn't have to be. It can be. It doesn't say Thomism can't accommodate phenomena, great phenomena. Dude, the work by Thomist psychologists is absolutely insane. These mm -hmm. guys are masters. So I love Thomism for a billion reasons, but, uh, you know, Thomism in the time of Thomas. <laughs> Maybe yeah. not. Actually, I love this new show that's out right now called, uh, 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 what is it called? Miracle Workers. Have you seen the show? No, no. Dude, Steve Buscemi plays God. And uh, what's his name? Harry Potter plays like a, a prayer answerer. He okay. plays like an admitted low level. It. Dude, it's so funny. But anyway, they do a second season where they're all in the Middle Ages and religion is playing itself out kind of in some of these good ways and so kind of in some of these bad. Anyway, it's a great show. Yeah. I brought it up for a reason that I now forget. So feel free to it's all right. It. It's a good wreck. Yeah, yeah, it's a good, good, good ref, bro. Um, so what was I saying? Okay, uh, Thomas uh, ends. Oh, yeah, right. So you begin with Thomas and the essences. Now Descartes comes in, of course, and he says, oh, you, you got essences. That's nice. Why don't you tell me about those? Why don't you justify those? Why don't you doubt those and tell me what you come up with? And yeah. he, you know, he says, he doubts and doubts and doubts. He says, nothing can be certain until you doubt everything, right? Yeah. That's, that's, of course, the, the, you know, the Cartesian way. And so, um, you know, so he doubts and doubts and doubts and doubts and doubts and realizes eventually the one thing I can't doubt or the one thing that when I doubt, it actually, it, 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 um, it, it, it speaks back to me mm -hmm. is the act of doubt itself. The fact that I doubt proves that I'm a thinking being, which proves that the, you know, cogito ergo sum, I think yep. therefore I am. And so from that, he develops this whole philosophy of rationality, right? And, um, uh, and, and this philosophy of rationality is built on the cogito. It's built on, you know, the, the, the rails of that train are built on syllogistic reasoning and, and all for the better, I, I should say. And at least if you're going to compare it to a Thomistic, Worldview, Thomism is great, but is it great for everything? No, yeah. Descartes really cracked the egg of progress open in ways that we benefit from today. That we're, you know, dude, I'm so yeah. glad to hear you say that. I just yeah. did a podcast. I just did my own episode defending Descartes' dictum, and I was just saying, like, as a Vantillian, I've always inherited that uh, this idea that Descartes sucks. And yeah, yeah, really yeah. Cool. Great problem. Yeah. I read it for myself, and I was like, I kind of like him, man. I, yeah. I know he's not writing everything. I'm not Cartesian, but kind of like him. So it's I so nice him. to hear you say some of that. Yeah, because you come to know them as people, and then you almost compare it to Van Til, who seems a little inhuman, p partly because he's writing in, like, he, sorry, that, that was meant to be a critique. I love Van Til. He's right, a right. human being, I guess. If, <laughs> I, reformed guys will literally jump at anything. He said he wasn't even a human. Yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so, so, but what I mean by that is, uh, is of course, for Van Til, you know, he's writing in his second language, so he doesn't always convey things as well as we get through, like, Descartes, you know, who's being translated to us by a master. And so, so we're, we're kind of stuck with the Van Til we have. I almost wish Van Til wrote, just wrote in Dutch, you know, yeah. so we could get, like, a better version, but instead we're, like, stuck with his English version of his yeah, idea. That's a good point. Yeah. Dutch, this would all be different. It would all be different. The whole system would be different. So, well you know, however much, right? But, yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so anyway, Descartes, so we got Thomas who has the essences, right? Tables are tables because they're tables. Uh, Descartes like interesting theory. And I have more thoughts on that. I have some notes. And so Descartes comes in, you know, says, you know, at the end of the day, if I doubt everything, the one thing I can't doubt is the fact that I'm doubting. Therefore, I thinking the thinking of the doubting is the proof that I'm existing. So I think therefore I am cogito ergo sum. Then he builds a whole system of rationality based on cogito ergo sum, his, you know, the dictum. And then he goes on to, uh, or rather Hume comes around and, and, and Hume is like, dude, you just... You just spun a great fictional web that has nothing to do with the real world. Congratulations on you know running a play for yourself in your own mind and writing a book about it, but that doesn't actually solve any philosophical questions. For Hume, he was like you know of course the, the, the you know the infamous metaphor of the of the billiards table where you know if I hit a ball and that ball goes forward and then hits another ball and it stops and the other ball goes forward and then it goes into the pocket. You know, what just happened? We say, well, the laws of physics, the laws of, really it was the law of logic that caused one ball to, you know, hit another ball and then move and transfer energy into the other, the, into the other. but, but, but uh, Hume's real problem with that comes in with the language of causality. Mm -hmm. Logic didn't cause one ball to hit, to, to move another ball. That's something that you invented to explain the happening of one ball moving another ball. Mm -hmm. All you know is that one ball started moving and then stopped moving, and then another ball started moving and stopped moving. You start inventing fiction when you start saying things like, 
cause. You know, you can say physically cause, you can talk about transfer of energy, you can talk about anything physically you want because all those things are impressions. How do you, how do you measure energy? How do you measure all of the quantifiable aspects of physics? Well, you have to measure it. You have yeah. to see it. It has to have an opportunity to make what Hume calls, of course, an impression on your mind. And from that impression, he make you, you know, you fabricate in your mind what he calls ideas. Mm -hmm. And ideas are totally personal. They are just conventions that we use to package, to zip, to to store in the database, the storehouse of the mind, whatever it is that we have in there. Uh, uh, which is for Hume all that we need to do, and the, the problem he sees with Descartes, of course, is that Descartes putting uh, he's putting he's putting all his chips on ideas. He's like, I'm going all in on ideas, man. And Hume's like, No, I'm going all in on impressions. But the problem, of course, with Hume is that once you lose, well, so with the problem with Descartes is that it kind of is like a play that he enacts in his own mind. He's like, Wouldn't it be nice if we could justify our existence by thinking, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. and then. Uh, you know, and then from there, Hume is like, yeah, it would be great, but that's not the world we live in. We live in a world where we see what we see and we kind of invent the rest. Yeah. And and then, um, so then comes along Kant, who reads, of course, Descartes first. It's his first love. It's his first, you know, philosophical girlfriend, so to speak. And and he's like, he's like in love with Descartes. He's in love with reason. He's in love with the cogito. He says, oh my goodness, this explains so much. And for him, I think it was necessary for him to become a Cartesian first. Could you imagine if Kant read Hume first? The yeah. world would be very different, I'll say. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, for him to read Descartes, um, he became fascinated. And, and what, what, what was important about Kant reading Descartes first was that um, he had to fall in love with reason. And he had to fall in love with reason as an escape from uh, what he saw as the as the superstition that caused the religious wars, you know, and trying and trying and trying to escape that. And yeah, in a way we're still trying to escape that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but for Kant, he read Descartes as a total like, suck it dad, suck it mom, Thomas yeah. stupid. You know, he, had, he was like, you know, wearing like the punk shirt, like mm -hmm. Thomas Aquinas, right? That was Kant in his early days. And then he moves on to Hume. And he says, of course, he's reading Hume's critique of Descartes. And he's like, oh. And he says, you know, when I read Hume, Kant says, he woke me from my dogmatic slumber. Yep. And what he means by that is, you know, he was so enamored with uh, Descartes that finally when he read Hume, he realized, you know what? I've been so obsessed over ideas. I haven't been so concerned with a lot of the problems of which the, uh, or rather a lot of the problems which the diversity, the multiformity, the plurality of human experience presents to this. Yeah. Well, and which comes back, of course, to some of the things we were talking about originally, the one and the many, the universal and the particular, right? That's what Kant, Kant's coming from a time when the universal and the particular, you know, the universe philosophically in the West at the time, in terms of the philosophical ideas, had expanded maximally, you know, to its ultimate uh, terminal point. And now in Kant, it was all coming back, you know, yeah. it was all shrinking again, it, and it was condensing and it was densifying. Uh, and the universe was shrinking again. And so in and the rationalist, in, in my mind, I'm thinking the rationalist, they're, they're using reason to try to unify everything. Right. And that's the, yep. the, the one. Yep. And that seems like kind of the rationalist way all the yep. way back. And then like the, the empiricists are, are focusing on the many and saying, dude, you can't. It's not all one. Like there's all yeah. this plurality. There's all these atoms. There's all this stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And then Kant, it's, it's ripping him apart here. Yes, exactly. Right. It, yeah. And, and his his life's purpose is to, you know, glue those things together somehow, which is essentially all he does. But uh, but 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 it's, of course, so much more sophisticated than that, because because, you know, what Kant comes up with is this fourfold taxonomy. Right. Uh, he does, Well, he doesn't come up with it, but it becomes a really critical component of how he articulates his philosophical solution to, you know, Kant wants to be a philosophical poly polygamist. He wants to, he wants a little Descartes. He wants a little Hume on the side too, yeah. you know? And so that's fine. And so the way he reconciles that for himself is that he has these four, you know, he brings these four categories into play. You've got a priori and I'll explain, you know, a priori, a posteriori, mm -hmm. right? And then you've got um, uh, synthetic and, uh, oh my gosh, dude. Analytic. Yeah. Analytic. I'm sorry. I'm like... <laughs> Oh, we've, we've gone of, of we've gone know, all yeah, 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 right, right. You've got the a priori. You know what, dude? You know what? Let's try it. Can I do this from memory? I think I can do it. Okay. So you've got a priori, a posteriori, synthetic, analytic. You've got synthetic, a pos, uh, you've got synthetic, a priori. That's mm -hmm. the artist one, which we'll get to in yep. a bit. You've got synthetic, a posteriori. That Those are claims like that bachelor is a millionaire. 
right? Because what's synthetic? So, right? The a bachelor is unmarried. Yeah, that's an analytic. Theory. Theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That bachelor is a millionaire. Is a synthetic a posteriori, right? Mm -hmm. Because it requires in uh, uh, it requires uh, observation and predication. So a priori means those things that we take for granted when we come to the table philosophically. They're things that function sort of in the in the um, you know behind the scenes of our minds. So to yeah, speak. before experience, right? It, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. A pri prior, a prior before experience, and then a posteriori, of course, comes after experience, mm -hmm. uh, and that indicates that they're, they're, the 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 predication is predicated upon experience. The predication is predicated upon observation. We can't speak, and of course, to predicate means to say, make a claim. You know that combines two variables, right? Mm -hmm. A is B. That yeah. is a predication, right? So when I say a bachelor is a millionaire. That's an ape. Well, let's see. That that would be an a posterior. I'm still an a posterior. Aren't I? Man, I'm missing this whole thing up. No, no. I think I think you're doing it because so uh, bachelor would be a priori. Wait, I, have it, I have it totally. I have it totally in my brain now. Okay, yeah, yeah. I have it totally in my brain now. A priori, a posteriori, synthetic, analytic. So so a priori synthetic it is what we'll get to in a moment. A priori analytic that is the bachelor's single, which mm -hmm. is you don't need to meet any bachelors, which is why it's a priori to know that all the bachelors you meet will be single. And it's analytic because the definition of bachelor is actually singleness. So the difference between synthetic and analytic is that analytic is one in which the predication is contained in the definition, right? Yeah. Where the definite, or rather, the, the definition is, or the predicate is contained in the subject, right? That's the that that that's that's analytic. Synthetic is where the predicate's not contained in a, in, in a subject, right? Mm -hmm. Now that moves us into the synthetic category, the synthetic a pri, or rather the 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 the, the synthetic a posteriori. That mm -hmm. would be the bachelor is uh, a millionaire, mm -hmm. right? That would be the bat because I got to know if he's a millionaire or not. Maybe he's a bum. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's why he's a bachelor. Needs some experience. You know, yeah. Right, but but I gotta know a posteriori. I, I gotta go out and look, and only after I look can I know if that guy's a millionaire. And you know, I gotta see. I gotta just gotta see. Yeah. And that's what a posteriori is. Now, a posteriori uh, analytic, I believe, is a non-category. Right? Am I wrong about that? A posteriori analytic. I'm pretty sure there's no such thing as an yeah. Analytic. No one ever talks about. It. It's always about the the synthetic. Contradiction, I think, is what he says. Is it's a, it's a, it's a paradox. Those are paradoxes, and, and yeah, antinomies. Yeah, yeah. An, an, antinomies. That's what yeah. I mean, right. Of course, uh, I yeah. need to brush up on my count, dude. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, and then, of course, there's the a priori uh, synthetic. Now, yeah. these are, this is the, this is the bread and butter of it all, of course. Yep. Which is that um, these are things where the, 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 the predicate's not contained in the subject, mm -hmm. but it's before experience. Yes. What can you say about reality? without observing a thing. Yeah. Oh man, and which the predicate is not contained in the subject, right? So in a way, the question is, does Descartes' cogito, what category does that fall in? And I mm -hmm. think at the end of the day, uh, 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 Kant has to push it. Uh, it has to push it into that synthetic category, or, or, or rather into that, um, he has to push it into that analytic category, right? Because because only in conceiving it as analytic can you incorporate the insights of Hume, yeah, as well. Because because if 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 Descartes' cogito is a synthetic a priori, we don't need Kant, and Hume's wrong. Mm. Like 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 all Kant's doing is advancing Cartesianism, and in that right. way, in no way has Hume awoken him from anything. Yeah, and he doesn't get his uh, Copernican revolution. That's right. That's right. So ha Hume comes in. Gives Descartes the boot out of the synthetic a priori, and and then in that place we have the you know the transcendentals for Kant. These are this is his transcendental method. These are the truths by which the mind functions to digest what he calls the the noumenal realm, which is the world out there, and that it digests that. It 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 uh, it unzips that file. It figures out what's there. It calculates it. It organizes it. It gives it to us, and that gives us the phenomenal realm. Which is when I look out, that's what I see. I see the phenomenal realm. Mm -hmm. Do I see the world as it really is? No, I don't. I see the world as it appears to me. I see the world as it appears to me post hoc, a posteriori. Mm -hmm. Right? It's always a posteriori, except for what's a priori, which is the question. And so for Kant, he has various of these, these principles that he uses, but one of them is basically <laughs> the capacity of making the subject object distinction. And for the, um, what, 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 uh, what McCormick is saying, of course, 
is that on an analytic basis alone, we can preclude the notion that God exists because analytically, we can see that the concept simply cannot exist. And so what McCormick wants to do is kick the God concept out of synthetic a priori, out of synthetic or out of analytic a priori, and he wants to kick it into analytic a posteriori. He wants to make it something that's an antinomy. He wants to make it a paradox, the divine concept. Which and is great. Like that, if, if that works, that's crazy. And that's like, dude, give it up because <laughs> yeah, give it up. The concept doesn't make sense. Learn to code, yeah, do it all. It no, it's if, if he's right, it's huge. It's everything. It's yeah. when I look out into the world, I'm alone. Yeah. When I wake up at night, I'm talking to myself. Right. <laughs> it's, a, right. it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So what I try to do is I try to say, listen, no, it's not. And I try to locate, I try to take those Kantian faculties and I try to say it's not just the numinal and the phenomenal. I'm sorry, there's the supernuminal, there's the prophenomenal, there's all of these, there's an entire analog to what we know as reality that is more real than anything we've ever experienced, is anything we've ever experienced, which founds and categorically taxonomizes everything we see so that whatever synthesizing work our mind does, you know, we're treading on sacred ground, we're borrowing, we're opening Christmas presents, and, and we're not saying thank you for them. And that is the act of secular philosophy. That is the act that, I, and, and, and again, on the one hand, it's not to say that Matt McCormick's not like a really nice, great guy who I'm sure would be like probably nicer and better person than I am, but it's unethical to say what he's saying because it's it's blasphemy. Mm. Now, Now, that sounds really harsh, doesn't it? <laughs> hey man, grace is beautiful. Great, beautiful, and 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 the the promise of the part of the promise of theology is that we can step on God's toes sometimes, and that's just learning how to dance, man. You know, it's it's he's cool with it. He's 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 not an abusive father. He's a loving father, and so so we 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 I think overload these things a lot because um, you know everything's so serious, everything's a heresy or it's not a heresy. But what we do is we lose that ability to do like what that his dark materials character did was be, to become an experimental theologian to see. We got to give it more time. The biggest yeah. thing theology needs right now is breathing room. You know, we need what is that? A decanter that you put wine in and it just yeah. kind of lets it breathe. Yeah. We don't have one of those for theology. Everything's like, you know, like a like a tight like bag. You know, everything has no breathing room and it's not getting any flavor. It's not opening up. And um and and that's what theology has to do because I and and I've been having these conversations with theologians. I think a lot of guys who are in the old school type seminary Bible college institutions. They have no incentive to do that. They mm. only have an incentive to play it safe. And and you know what is brave there? All of us know isn't really brave, because because you know at the end of the day, in the next ten years or so, we're going to see we're going to see I think a, a um, we're going to see a surge of people who are willing to ask hard questions, but are even more committed to the project of historic Christian orthodoxy than ever before. And I hope to be a part of that project. I yeah. really, really do. But I don't think it's going to happen in the institutions because the people who have a stranglehold on the green light on those projects are the people who are the wrong people and they don't understand. That's right. That's a hundred percent right. But what were you just talking about with, with like blasphemy, blasphemy and, and God, like, uh, What's a good matter? I don't know. He's got like steel toed boots. Like you're not, yeah. you're not hurting him by doing that. Right. Like, even if, he, even if he doesn't, he's cool yeah. with you, man. You know? Yeah. Right. And, and because of grace, because of grace, we don't want to be presumptuous. We don't want to presume all that stuff. I get it guys. I know I'm listening to, right. it. but, but uh, like Mike Ray uh, in his hiddenness book, I just interviewed him the other day and he was in, in his book, he was discussing Job. We didn't get to talk about this, hmm. but he was saying like Job, kind of stepped out on a ledge here, man. And he kind of said some, some I actually have a section on Job in in the dissertation. I don't yeah. know if got to it yet. I haven't got to it yet. No, no, no. But but I've got this from you too, just listening to you as well and, and the hero's journey and and uh even you you talk about like uh church discipline and someone going out on their own being disciplined and that's like a one of the best things you can do for someone in that position. Yeah. And it's just exactly what you said. There's there's a lot of uh, rails in academic theology that kind of keep you and weird rails where it's like they don't keep you from saying stupid stuff that I think is just so dumb that like, why did you write a book on that's dumb? <laughs> but it keeps you from asking like the questions that we want to know about uh, that I want to know about. This is the this is the metaphor that I think I use for that. Right. So because there's a response to that. Right. Like I was talking to a buddy the other day, very high level 
executive at a, at a major seminary. And he was kind of, I, I was kind of, I was being a little like, eh, confessionalism, there's so many constraints. Ah. Yeah. And he was like, you know, man, it's actually good for you. And it's actually a good thing. And I was like, you know, man, you're right. And, but, but, but his point was, I think important, uh, but, but usually that's where it ends, right? Uh, someone says, hey man, confessionalism is important. Somebody else says, hey man, back off. And then somebody else says, hey man, but it's still important. And it ends there, right? <laughs> Always was, right? Uh, um, and so, so, but, but what I want to do is I want to take it, a fourth stage again. I want to. I want to take it. Uh, I want to take it one more step. Um, I completely lost my spot. Professionalism. Again. You're going to take it one more step. Um, there. The. Well, would if I could just back up real quick. So, so confessionalism, dude. I. I. I'm, I'm coming in from not being confessional. Right. Grew oh. up in be free. But the 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 kind of barriers I'm talking about are like the not not strictly written out. Right. They're they're like the un the unmentioned. Ooh. Um, yeah, that, that kind of keep us in line. But, but continue on with with your thought there. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, I um. Uh. So I think it's like this, right? So somebody says, like, "Hey, man, like, would it hurt to like bench press on a Smith machine instead of like just a real bench? It's like it's technically safer for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have those hooks there and all that stuff. It's like, yeah, but you're not really benching, like, yeah. right? Or like that. And so, and that's kind of how I see like. Uh, you know, wild man theology versus confessional theology. I'm like, yeah, I, I could bench on the Smith. I, you know, I, I could get a pretty good workout on a bit on a Smith bench. Yeah. At the end of the day, I want to know what I can bench. You know, yeah. at the end of the day, and at the end of the day, if you live your life in a confessional institution, you'll never know what you can bench ever. Yeah. And that's the problem. And that's the cost. And that's not a problem. That's a choice. It's a choice. You minister yeah. to minister to ministers. I said I said one too many to minister to ministers. I stuttered. Right, I'm training pastors who are going to go serve the people of God. Yes, as it, well, not me, but you know, people, the generic I in the seminary world. Um, you know, that person's going to go do that, and I think that's an important service. Yes, part of that service, just like military service, comes with sacrifice. Yeah, and if you don't admit that you're sacrificing certain epistemological opportunities so that you can be in the position to, with integrity and standing in the stream of orthodoxy with no question, yeah, bring down the legacy of the truth of the Christian faith and the gospel to the next generation of ministers in the church, we of course have to have those people doing that. Right. Of course, right. that's not what I'm doing. Well, and, and God made people to do that, right? Like He didn't he made to do it. He made if, them do it. If you did that, you'd be, you know, a round peg trying to fit in a square hole, and you drive everyone nuts, including okay. yourself. It wouldn't be good for anybody. Yeah. Wouldn't be good for anybody. Yeah. yeah. I feel that. I feel that same way, dude. I, I, I feel. I mean, we're we're different, but we're God made us in, in a lot of similar ways, and it's. You did, man. You did. I, want to, I want to figure some stuff out. I love, I love like the lay questions. I get this from some of my philosophy friends too. Like I wrote my, um, I wrote my sample piece for uh for applying to philosophy on uh the yeah. simulation hypothesis I just i just uh transferred it over from my theology paper uh and it's like they might not like that they might think that's stupid that's too popular level and it's like yeah but this is what i'm dealing with on the reg all the time on twitter right. yeah. everyone wants to know about it and they all use it and they say well it's actually more plausible than belief in god and it's like well let's test that then yep you gotta dude testing is a matter of experimentation Right, experimental theology has to yeah. happen. Let's yeah. get out, and that's what I want to do. That's what, and that dude, that, that that's literally what you're doing, which is why, like, in a way, you're like, I'm all like, I'm all talk, you're all you're all walking, and like, you're doing it real time. And it's essentially sitting down with people saying, Hey, uh, I don't have a time limit here, this is not the queen's gambit, we're not racing, right? Um, let's do the math till we figure it out. Yeah. And we'll just, you know, you know what I would love to do sometime yeah. a podcast with you and like maybe a couple other people that's like nine hours long. <laughs> yeah. We just go and we're just, we got like a buffet. We got like yes. cigars. We got the whole day. We got breakfast, lunch and dinner ready. And we'll just like, today we're solving the problem of evil. Yeah. <laughs> and we get as far as we get, you know, that'd be awesome, that'd be? And just record it and just be like, if you want to watch nine hours, this is nine hours. Yeah. That'd be awesome. I love that. And have everybody. I want to have Greg Boyd there. I want to have Walter Brueggemann on there. I want to have Kevin yeah. Hoover there. I want to have Paul Helm there. I want to have everybody there. And I, because I know when they're all there, they're going to be cracking jokes. They're going to be admitting their weaknesses. Yeah, that doesn't really work so well as I, as I say it does in the book and blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and you get to see it. 
And that's what the, the people goes are, down a little bit. Not they, not that they have a ton of egos, but yeah. Yeah, we don't we don't need the CIA and the church. We don't need a national security secret agency. We can be honest about what doesn't work and what do, we don't have to keep secrets from the from the, the ecclesial public. We yeah. have no rationale to do that. Yeah. Um. And and so so the, so the notion that leaders need to well, it's not about leaders. I'm trying to move away from this idea that like the church is the problem because the church is the problem in many ways, just like many other people and things are the problem in many other ways. But, yeah. uh, but, but, uh, but the problem of course, isn't with the church, you know, the, the problem happens in the church. Yeah. And so in that, in that way, it kind of gets falsely or defaultly attributed to the leadership or to the church or to the people. And in a way it gets a lot of crap flung on it that it doesn't necessarily deserve, especially because of all the good that it does. It really does a lot of good. And so, um, but on the other hand, you know, we, the church does need to become more honest and it does need to become transparent when you've got people like an institution claiming to be like, yeah, we kind of know what pastoral ministry like is and like what successful Orthodox Christian evangelical ministry like is. And then in like two years, five year top guys like completely burn out and fly out of ministry. And we're like, didn't you like pick those guys? Yeah. Weren't they like your like biggest people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't trust you anymore. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, at, you know, at, at four, you had me at four, but at five, I, I'm just, you know, I'm out. Yeah. And so at that point, it's like, but that's okay. That's okay. And the whole notion that those things are scandalous, the whole notion that I ever depended on those people at all to yes. tell me anything trustworthy was, of course, yeah. on me. Yeah. On me. So, so I can be bitter at people all day long, but I think about it, man. You know, I almost submitted a book proposal once where I wrote the book proposal and it was really in a time when I was like really kind of first becoming acquainted with the trauma concept, but also really coming acquainted with like Jocko and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wrote the proposal and it was so sappy and it was so saturated with this self-pitying victimhood, like, like it was just so deep twisted into the darkness of my own mind in terms of like to what I was entitled you yes. know, as yes. a Christian, what I was entitled to, you know, like, like, and I read it and I, and I remember reading it when I was done with that. And I was like, Jocko would be so embarrassed by this. Yeah. Like if he ever, like, if I was his friend and I wrote this book, he would be so embarrassed for me. And, and I realized that. And, and I think coming back to theology, right. Listen, man, the, my biggest struggle with theology is I look at like a lot of people in these positions getting paid money to do what they love full time, which is the same thing I love to do full time. And it's hard not to be bitter, honestly. Yeah. It's hard not to realize that like I've outpublished like 80 percent of the faculty of the place where I got my Ph.D. by the time I graduated. But still, you know, my, the only career advice I got was consider being a missionary and consider being a high school teacher. Yeah. It's like I could be bitter about that or I could recognize that nobody owes me a damn thing yeah. and that life is an adventure and that's all I'm promised mm -hmm. and that what's next is best. And yeah. I'm so excited. And the more I was able to lean into that, the more I learned, the more I grew. And it was tough because it took me away from theology for a while. And that yeah. was hard. It was like being away from a lover in a way, you know, yeah. um, but, but now I'm back baby. And, and I'm here to do some serious work. I don't know what that work is going to look like constructively after these courses, because I'm almost um, done with my full course curricula here that's going to be up in March 15th or April 15th on the site. But but what's really exciting to me is because I think it's important to set subject matter standards, industry standards up before we venture into these things and to have accessible digital resources, something that functions very much like Lagos, but on a public SEO type platform. Oh, that's a prolegomena. Bro. Prolegomenetician in you. That's that's so funny, man. Yeah, it's the Van Hooser. Yeah. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. so, yeah. So so essentially, I I want to clear my thread as much as possible. Yep. You know, obviously, like Van Hooser. And um, right. but but uh, but but I do want to speak. And 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 at the end of the day, I think you can only speak this. You, you know, you get better at speaking about God the same way you get better at doing anything. You just got to do it. And and part of it's messing up, man. You know, and that that's where we miss it. Okay, this is the biggest thing. So I mean, dude. People who can't roll with this have left a long time ago. So, yeah. um, uh, but dude, the biggest thing for me about the PhD was that. <laughs> I, wait, actually, you can you can edit this, right? I could. 
Okay. No, don't edit it. Keep it in. Uh, uh, I was like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like making so many people bored, dude. I lost my thought. What no, was this it? was so good. You're talking about PhD. Real, real quick. Let me, let me jump in yeah. real quick, dude. One thing that I think uh, is, is helpful for me, and even just thinking through with you right now, um, constructive theology. But, but you say uh, experimental theology, right? That's that's the f- phrase you're using. Experimental. Yeah. Experimental theology. Well, I'm I'm borrowing that from his dark materials, the HBO Max show. So okay. it's not my term. It's, well, I uh, like it. I, th- I think it's, it's good. Who wrote that book, The Golden Compass, and whatever? Anyway, it's uh, yeah. Well, I think that's really helpful because if we see that that's a, a position in the church that that that's necessary, we need to give those dudes some slack and not call them heretics every second, probably. Oh, and, right. That was what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's exactly right. Well, so here's the thing, man. Because like. When I started like getting deep into my, uh, well, like late seminary, early, P- you know, like late MDiv, early PhD, like when I was like working a lot with Scott, like towards the end of my MDiv, but then of course I was working like a lot, you know, when you're in your dissertation phase, you don't really talk to your doctor father, but like, in, you know, when you begin, you're like kind of working a lot with your, with, I was working a lot with Kevin, like when I first started my PhD. So I had like three or four years where I was working very closely with my advisors and, um, and while I was doing that, of course, I was reading so much and you put yourself through so much and you you, you subject yourself to Jacques Derrida and the post-structuralists and you want to understand and you, you throw yourself against the rocks of these ideas over and over and over again and you get bloodied and beaten and, blah, and you figure it out and you're like, mm, I figured it out, I figured it out. But then you look back and there's, there's this relational wake behind you where you're like, man, I didn't handle that relationship well while I was figuring that out. Yeah. I was really an asshole while I was doing that. Yeah. I was doing this. I was doing that. And and I look back on those times. And, and again, this is a perspective choice that we have to make. On the one hand, and this is the way I would try or probably instinctively think about it five, seven years ago, is I say, why can't these pastors just get what I'm doing? But then the other part of me was, you know, this is the suffering to which Christ calls mm. us. And if it was any less lonely, it might be that much less significant to us because, mm. because if people just got what we were doing, we wouldn't be doing something important. That's true. Um, and so, so, so the fact that people really didn't get what I was doing or trying to achieve through learning these things because I couldn't explain to them what I was getting from it. You know, the yeah. only deliverable they understand is apologetics, right? Mm-hmm. Why is Derrida wrong? Why is Michel Foucault wrong? Why is yeah. Jean-Paul Sartre wrong? Tell me, tell me, tell me. And you know, that's that's the spirit of apologetics. Yeah. Is, tell me, tell me, tell me why I don't have to think. It's the conversation, right. it's conversation enders rather than conversation starters, you know? Corners off and just, you know, off, yeah. 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 Me what why he's dumb yeah yeah you keep you keep eroding the christian theology until it's acceptable and you're like we'll have to stop doing this eventually right 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 <laughs> it's like well you won't you'll never stop and then eventually you'll have nothing and then then we'll be where we are today so uh but yeah so but so we will be called heretics mm-hmm. be, not because we're heretics but because people use that word to refer to like dispensationalists, you know, the dispensational heresy. It's like, if it weren't for the dispensationalists, you would not believe in inerrancy today. Guaranteed. You wouldn't. They held it down. Yeah. And so, you know, Joe Thorne made that great point in my podcast years ago. And I thought that was a fantastic point. Um, But, but, you know, we have to have such a, because what are the two options, right? It's the one and the many. And that's, that's the binary we have to escape. Mm -hmm. Part of it is the, is, is that's the beauty of Quinean thinking versus Aristotelian thinking is that there are options for expansion that are not merely uh, monoaxial. They're not merely on the, you know, on the X axis or the Y axis. You can't just go vertically up or down. Whereas in Quine's web, you can expand out, you know, it's like Adobe Illustrator. You can expand the points. You can, all of the intersections change. That's the beauty of theology is that it's, uh, it's, it's not that the truth is always changing. God is the truth and he is immutable and does not change. And that is the foundation. Again, going back to uh, Titus 1, 2, 1 Timothy 1, 9 or 2, 9, where, uh, uh, you know, God who cannot lie is the foundation of his faithfulness to us. The fact that he can't deny himself, of course. And so what we get from that is 
that 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 on the one hand, God comes in, gives for us a foundation for speaking about not only his unicity, but the uniform but the uniformity, which is imprinted on nature by virtue of that ectypal expression of that unicity. And then on the other hand, you have the multiformity. And by holding these two things together, what we have is an appreciation for the multiformity of truth that honestly, I think is too much to ask people to understand. Mm -hmm. I think it's too much to ask. Yeah. And I think three or four years ago, I don't know, maybe it might've been more like three or four minutes ago. I don't know, but I, you know, I, I just kind of came to peace a little bit with the fact that people just aren't going to get it. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I am in pursuit of truth and so much of the truth, which has enabled me to inquire successfully about the truth of God is truth. I've received from the Christian tradition. Yeah. I did not come up with it. Right. I right, right. moved a few jigsaw puzzles around here and there, but that's kind of the game that you play. And so, so, you know, for me, the, all the parts are there, and when you when you're not merely thinking in terms of Aristotle, true or false, but you're thinking rather in terms of Quinean here or there, um, then what you can do is think of theology more, or also rather, as a project of rearranging, just as just as much as it is a project of construction and, and deconstruction. Because in a way, the Aristotelian concept of truth only only a allows you to inquire about the truthfulness of God in so far as you ask the question of whether, whether he exists, whether he is this, whether he is that, rather than the locative or topological question about the function, role, and place of that idea in the system. So what we do is we actually turn one stop into two. When we learn a truth about God, we don't assume that we have that truth. What we have, of course, is an understanding of the truth. Mm. And that understanding has to pass a series of tests in order to be verified before we assume it as part of our system. Yeah. At least as that's something we should be doing as part of our yeah. due diligence. And that's the task of theology. And the thing is, Everybody who has a problem with constructive theology has 2,000 years of history for them and against them, right? Because on the one hand, they've got, a, they've got a great through line of orthodoxy that carries them all the way to today. On the other hand, that through line of orthodoxy, you know, they pass that football. I need to play football. I don't even know why I use football metaphors. I'm going to watch football. I don't even know a single team. I couldn't even tell you a single rule. And so, so I, mean, I don't know, whatever. I like Tom Brady. But anyway... Uh, the point is that, like, that theological through line of orthodoxy, I mean, it was thieves and bandits that carried that down the line very often. And, and we have to respect the fact that they were so audacious that uh, they really shouldn't have been doing, you know, so much of orthodoxy was perpetuated by troublemakers. And, yeah. and that's a beautiful thing. And, yeah. and, and, and I, I, I don't, there's, and there's, there's an error on every side. There's an error on every side. Yeah. There are people in the church who are troublemakers just for the sake of being troublemakers, like Demas. Hmm. And, and those people should be gone. And they 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 should be either pastored, you know, like like that 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 can't be happening. It's too disruptive. It's it's that needs to be curbed. But but on the other hand, you know, what you have um with people who are willing to be troublemaking in the church is you have somebody who's essentially willing to face the full wrath of uh the people of God, you know, I, I I read a review on Goodreads the other day about uh, you know just some WTS PhDs like he 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 doesn't have a biblical ecclesiology, okay? I mean, like like the, like the, this will hurt people here, and I'm just like, dude, I feel so bad for you, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh. That's what gets your juices flowing. And again, it's like I'm willing to have heated debates about ecclesiology. I'm like, let's do it. Let's yeah. absolutely do it. But when, but when you're willing to, um, when you're willing to do real theology in meme form, now you're a clown, hmm. dude. I'm a clown. I do theology in meme forms all the time. All I've yeah. been doing here so far is like meme. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, um, you know, we're all clown. I, I had this, there's that great gif of uh, you know, what's his name, uh, Mr. Rogers putting on the clown mask. And stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but. You know, we're all clowns at a level, but the, the, the goal is, you know, maybe less clowning than more, you know. Mostly. Yeah. And well, so that's what I try to do. And the way to be less clowning than more is to take seriously the question of truth and mm -hmm. to take seriously the question of truth so much. And this is what always bothered me about confessionalism was just the notion that just like, 
Like, how are you sure tomorrow you're not going to have to quit your job? Like, how are you so sure? Like, you, like you must have a serious confidence in your conscience, like in your subjective capacities because, or maybe I'm just that volatile. So I just think it's normal and everybody else has this like, you know, cool yeah. stuff that I just don't know about. But, but the truth is, you know, theology requires volatility. It requires bravery. It requires audacity. And, and we don't have a palette for that right now. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a palette for theological audacity because they're doing it in Judaism. They're even doing it in Islam. They're doing it in Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism has been doing it forever and they have their own messes, but Protestantism, it's so clenched. It, mm. it, it, it can't, you know, it can't do anything with what it's got. All it can do is keep saying what it's already said. And you see that, right? Well, dude, and it's so, it's so it's what we've all always been saying over and over again. Yeah. I don't want to change for the sake of change. Yeah. I want to preserve orthodoxy. That's not what I'm talking about. For the sake of truth, truth, though, right? For the sake of truth. For the sake and of truth. We should be coming up with, as you said, more and better tests of verifying how and why and what about certain theological truths are true, yeah. and, and then start building those tests at scale. Because I think people are getting to the point where they're really wanting to kick the tires on some of these ideas, and they're not quite sure how. Mm -hmm. And I think people who are or if people who are orthodox don't come in and show people how to kick the tires of orthodox doctrine people who are unorthodox yeah. will come in and teach yeah. them how to kick those tires and they'll teach them how to slash those tires right dude it's exactly. like it's like we we're, we're the well i don't know if i'll include myself but but the exploratory theologian they're like the the safe one saying like hey i'm on your side still but yes. it's ironic because in in protestant tradition the guys who started our tradition, it starts with Jesus. Yeah, but the guys who like, you know, started protesting or whatever, they were these kind of theologians who were who were shaking things up and saying, well, what do we mean that the Christ's body and blood is here? What does that mean? Well, I disagree with you and I'm going to write a whole treatise against you mm -hmm. and we're going at it here. And and yeah. that, that's, well, Athanasius, you know, I'm like Athanasius. I'm going to stand for the truth. Yeah. Well, dude, that dude went against everyone. Like, yeah. Yeah. So he had that kind of, thing to say i don't care i'm going where the truth says here's what's up i don't care if all of you are wrong this is what's up yeah right and and at the end of the day i think that's the way to do it as long as there's no entitlement behind it right because because that's that that that's like the toxic version of like i'm committed to truth and i'll yeah. never I depart from the truth and you know like well yeah, but like, have you ever changed your opinion on anything ever? No, interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah. but well, but it's more like uh, like, hey, dude, show me why I'm wrong. Here, I can't help but think this. This is the truth. This is what I think the truth is. Like, can yeah. you make an argument? Help me then. Like, yeah. don't just jerk. But like, I think this is true. I, I'm not gonna move my conscience to deny the truth. That's crazy. It's 1984 stuff. So you got to help me if, if I'm wrong here. And that's actually what Paul said. The problem with Demos was, was that he wasn't holding a faith in a good conscience. Yeah. And that's yeah. what we need to do is hold the faith in a good conscience. Now that doesn't mean, you know, the Trinity just doesn't feel good to my conscience today. So I'm, you know, it's not that it's wow. Like, you know, the, the, this aspect of the Trinity really is bugging me today. Maybe, I'll re you know, I'm, I'm going to look more into that. And again, it's about respecting the slowness of theology, right? Yeah. Theology should be done very slowly. Yeah. In fact, most luxury items are made very slowly. Yeah. And I want to, I'm, I'm not a luxury human being, obviously, just look at me. But I would like to create something like a luxury theology only in that it is significant and it's different and it's distinctive and it's respectable and it's elegant maybe well, maybe not elegant but it's respectable it's strong it's got tinsel strength that maybe is impressive you know and that's what i think theology needs right now and and part of that's going to come in a few ways it's going to come with conceptive progress uh, it's going to come with personality um i think Right now, a lot of young evangelicals are clinging to old institutions because they think that one day that credibility that those old figureheads have are going to be handed down to them. But the truth is, by the time that credibility is handed down to them, if it even ever is at all, it's not going to be worth anything. And what we need is a new generation of young women and men, theologians, together 
forging a new way forward that includes charity, conversation, and huge respect for difference of opinion. And that's actually one of the things I really love about TEDs, you know, especially coming from such a reform seminary where everybody's like, I am reformed, you know, and it's like going to TEDs, you know, you got you got Josh Jip, you got Count Campbell, you got, you know, David Louie, you got Van Hooser at the time you had Tom Call, you know, and you, you, it was just kind of a great like, uh, you know, everybody's just kind of like bouncing into each other at the gym, just figuring it out. And I loved that because you can kind of see you're like, I don't know about that guy's uh, method. You, you get these little comments and you're like, I like that because you, because I felt like I really got a great, honest expression of, of where these guys were coming from at Trinity because they had to be honest, you know? Uh, which I thought was really cool. And and that's what we need in the next generation. We need not only people who are brave enough to 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 manifest or achieve or at least pursue some kind of theological progress. We need personalities that are actually able to show up and articulate and quite honestly to entertain, to market, to perform, to stay on video, to talk, to look at a text. Honestly, what we've been doing so far today in this video, I've really deserved it because I've talked so, so much big picture. But the, in reality, I don't even know if you still want to do this i mean we kind of went through a little bit but like really we're working through ideas we're working through texts ideally we have a whiteboard on here right and we're tracing these things and we're actually doing the math in real time uh not 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 ideally like in this episode like this right. but, but just like maybe as a culture theologically what we're going to do is by the time people are 20 year who are 20 years younger than us are our age they're going to thank us hopeful i mean we can only hope for creating a culture of theological discourse which is respectful, open, ecumenical, at least in, uh, in at least in network, and and uh, 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 is not characterized by the kind of infighting right now that inhibits these kinds of things. Do you know how much better reform theology would be, evangelical theology would be, if maybe we still said, okay, open theism is not uh, 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 an orthodox evangelical view. But we're still going to keep Greg Boyd, you know, really close to this conversation because he because he's a really important conversation partner here. And if he's willing, we'd really like him to be here. Yeah. You know, that kind of mindset. That's the best, man. That's always the best. I remember I finished my Ph.D. for, you know, a year I was living in Utah. The only theologians I had to talk to were the Mormons. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I would just talk to these guys all day in the gym and at the library and. Man, it was the, so much fun because I was the minority at that point, which mm -hmm. was just great. But these guys were willing to go to scripture, you know, but they, it was like this weird yeah, yeah, yeah. thing where you're like, let's do it, man. And so so that was a lot of fun. And I feel like we need to have that same spirit of camaraderie because what I love about, and maybe this is something we could really learn from the Mormons. What I loved about the Mormons, you know, the Mormons, and maybe, maybe you say something like this and it, it's like, well, it's because you are a Christian, uh, but, but it's... They they never treated me like I wasn't saved or a mm. Christian, ever. They talked to me about God. They prayed with me. They prayed to Jesus Christ with me. Um, they, and hey, I'm not, listen, let's not go down that road. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about disposition here. Yeah. I'm talking about disposition. I'm talking about the fact that they were willing to put their arm on me and say, Lord, you know, thank you so much for my friend Paul. Right, mm -hmm. and, and I could pray with them, and 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 the fact that they were willing to do that, and even talk with me about non-Trinitarian theology, I thought that was so great, and I learned so much, and never had I ever uh, had this debate with anybody before. Mm -hmm. And and tr the truth is, dude, there's a, there's dozens of those waiting for me right here at home, mm -hmm. right here in evangelicalism. I want that stuff all day. That's the kind of stuff we should be doing, but we're yeah. not. You know who does this really well? It's Paul Vanderclay on his YouTube. The dude, Paul, yeah, are you watching Paul Vanderclay on YouTube? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah dude, I mean, he's he's you and him are doing something very similar, you know. And and um, uh, you know, Paul, he just brings in everybody, which is yeah. what I love about that. Which is why he's growing like so fast. Which is why he has a huge YouTube channel, huge Discord channel, and all these guys are attracted to the to the conversations he's starting because. This guy is all about bringing people together theologically, talking about the issues, listening to arguments, because he's playing a long-term strategy. I'm telling you what, that guy's that. I think Paul Vanderclay very much lives. He, he, I, my sense of Paul Vanderclay is that he's a very like content individual in the sense that he. I don't. I think it would take a lot to sort of knock him off kilter, but I, I see him 
leveraging his stability and his role, you know, as, as, as a pastor um, uh, to bring people together, to help them share ideas. And to, and I think the guy has a long-term, he's going to have a long-term effect precisely because he's just where people go. He's yeah. just where people go. And I think Christianity is just where people don't go. It's mm -hmm. just where people don't go. And, and, and we need to become the place where people go, not in a seeker way, but in the opposite way, which is to say what Van Til says, that what we have are the resources here to extrospectively look out on the world and say, uh, uh, all of this is available to us, all of it. Yeah. And we have to understand it. We have to understand the role it plays. We have to understand how that substance works in this system, how that substance or that subsistence functions in this system, all of it, all of it we have to do. But why don't I talk to, I mean, I, I have, why do I have to go searching for people who disagree with me? I don't, I, I don't want that. I never wanted that. When I became a Christian, nobody in my family was a practicing Christian. And that, that's just what I was used to. I, you know, my dad was like, what are you doing? Like, I, like, like when I went to Bible college, he was like, you're wasting your life. He's like, you could be on Wall Street. You could be doing yeah. anything you want. And I was like, dad, you're so foolish. Mm. And I, there was a foolishness in what I had in my perspective, sir. I was a bit of an idealist, but you know, man, I loved it. I loved it. I loved the idea of just having somebody look at my faith and saying to my faith and say, saying to my face, you're a fool. I love that. I don't want anything else. It's what I want. I want to be called a fool for Christ yeah, all day, every day. And then I want to, and then I want to have the conversation because for Van Til, that's the starting point course i'm a fool yeah of course i'm a fool to you of course yeah wow. dude that, that was that's i have a similar being called a fool makes you face what you actually believe yeah like am i a fool in, in what kind of sense like am yeah. i a genuine fool fool proper or yeah. am i fool for christ <laughs> right is this genuine? does this make sense and and that's that's that was the good of apologetics but then yeah. studying van Til, I realized I need to know the theology behind this. And I found some theology with teeth, right? And yeah. and then going from that, I was like, well, I was already predisposed to the creative theology because I think I think Westminster is a funny place in that I don't know it like you do, but it seems to me from the outside that they're chock full with creative theologians. Um, yeah. But there's also very tight boundaries. And the boundaries are just different than the boundaries that you'd find at Calvin or something yeah. uh, with the more historical folks who are you no know, history of reform theology and right answers reform theology and still history, but Vantillion and creative. And let's, let's go with Bob Inc, you know, uh, instead of like Turretin, maybe, uh, if, if we have to, right. Right. Uh, and, and so I was already predisposed to that, but, but then dude, following my own, my own trajectory here, looking at guys like Ryan Mullins and being like, this oh, dude, oh just wants to shake up the faith and he wants to say that the, the you know the timeless god and then talking with him and being I, I just asked him straight out like hey dude was it hard for you to come to that position of of saying that the god is in time or time is an aspect of his being mm -hmm. he's like it was really hard for me and yeah. just hearing him say that was like yes thank you okay you wrestled with it. this wasn't something you took lightly yeah this is something that your your conscience made you come to because you thought this is the truth right and, right. and all this exactly. platform opened up my idea towards that towards that uh, idea as well, or opened my mind towards that idea as well. Dude, Ryan Mullins really was a big catalyst for me theologically, huh. you know, in terms of really going back to that Donald McKinnon concept of philosophy and the burden of theological honesty, you know, because I had written an article on the exegetical basis of a possible concept of divine simplicity. It was when I was still like reaching for divine simplicity. I was yeah. like, but um, and and he had just published, I think, in the Journal of Reformed Theology on I want to say simplicity, but I, I'm I, I'm not I'm I'm gonna mess it up if I try to tell the story. But anyway, he was just super kind to me, and I remember I sent him my article because I I I pulled a, I I um, had a, a few significant quotes from his article, and I was like, this guy is never gonna email me back. And then I remember he emailed me like a two thousand word email. He's yeah. like, dude, and it was so encouraging, and it was so like. This is what was good. Maybe push this a little bit. Maybe do that a little bit. And I would say the biggest gift older theologians have ever given me in my life is adding constructive creativity to my project. Actually, I, I um, shout out to Nate Shannon, who's a professor at Trinity in uh, in, in South Korea. 
which is associated with TIU, I believe, with, with TEDS, I believe. Uh, Nate Shannon and I were at uh, uh, Westminster together, and um, dude, that that guy was my that guy was my mentor, man. Mm. That guy was everything in terms of who I wanted to be theologically. He was the best. He was he he wrote his dissertation on Nicholas Walterstorff at I, I believe Free University, but of course got his I think M A R T H M at Westminster. But Nate Shannon, man, that's another guy like Art like Ryan Ryan Mullins. Actually, you need to get Nate Shannon on here. Yeah. That guy is the man. He you know he's probably if he if he's hearing me bring him up right now, he's like Paul, no, don't say my name. But uh, but but no. Nate, Nate, Nate is amazing, and he he is a philosopher of religion. But he's really, I mean, more most of anything, he's a theologian. And I, I don't want to speak for him, so I won't. But but you're, you're definitely going to want to meet Nate. I'll I'll introduce you to him via email. He was my mentor. He was my mentor, okay. and um, well, he maybe not, wouldn't want to own that. But but he but uh, dude, seeing this guy do what he could do with theology, he was so open. He was so open. He would just, you know, you could say anything to him, anything, and he would just go, "Okay, let's mm. think about it," you know. And and I always believe, and I always believed it because we always did. And and uh, you don't have that that culture, you know, at a lot of seminaries, especially a lot of big money seminaries, you know. Like I remember there were these nights at seminary would be like Southern Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, <laughs> like you know, it's like, why? Yeah, why? Yeah, Those, you know. Now I know so many people at Southern and Boyce, and I'm like, dude, these guys are like so legit you know and yeah. um and and there's just this like attitude among these seminaries that like if you're different than me like what's wrong with you like you're not a, like you're like like you're a pedo baptist like uh you're an, you know you're you're a credo baptist uh i listen i don't know man like like i think the closest thing we have to this is like clap acts on twitter right now mm -hmm. i think that's the best the church is doing in interecumenical theology is twitter clap acts currently you know you have evangelicals and catholics together which is like what even what 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 even yeah. is that right yeah. like like uh yeah, yeah. Uh, and so so what we need is a movement we need a movement of new theologians who disagree on a lot but agree on a few core cultural and methodological issues and if we can corral that group together, I think we can provide a lot of actionable, credible, informed, verifiable theological resources for the church from a community of people who are bound together in the love of Christ and in the project of speaking about the, the most difficult thing in the world to speak about. Yeah. And, and, and uh, relatively speaking, our disagreements are so small. We need that movement because guess what? We had a movement 10 years ago that did it. We had a movement 20 years before that that did it. We had a twin movement 30 years before that. And that was the most successful with Billy Graham, of course. But then after that, you've got the moral majority and you've got the megachurch movement. And after that, you've got the whole TGC, DG thing, you know, whatever. And and and, and these attempts become less and less successful over time because the 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 rate at which the this content becomes expired is uh, greater and greater because the you know the the refresh rate of the internet is just getting faster and faster. Yeah. So that's just the natural consequence of these things, obviously. But but that's what we need, bro. Yeah. But and it has to be more than it has to be formal in some way. We have to do this. We have to build something. We have to put something together where we're bringing we're bringing people who really disagree, but who really agree. Yeah, we well, need to come together and say the credibility that we've been that we've been hoping to receive for a long time from yeah. the older generation. It ain't coming. And by the time it's coming, it's going to be depreciated so low. We're not going to be able to do anything with it. So it's let's so build true. our own credibility. Let's build yeah. our own institutions. Let's build our own conversations. Let's ask our own questions. And even let's publish our own freaking books and yeah. websites. And that's what we're going to do. I know that's what we're going to do. I know in five, 10 years, the, the, digital e the, 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 the digital landscape of the theological ecosystem online is going to be completely different. I know that for a fact. And people are... COVID has changed a lot and people in important institutions are going to be doing a lot of important work over the next few years. And I'm excited, bro. I'm real excited. One of those people being you, if I might add. Thanks, man. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Well, no, for sure. Dude, I, I think, I think you, you, you brought up movements and I see like, maybe I'm not on the, on the tail end of this, but like the new Calvinism kind of inaugurated by Piper, mm. those dudes uh, grew up a little bit. And they're like, well, let me go read what Piper read, right? Or let me yeah. go read what, what Sproul is talking about. Who, right. who do they cite? Who are in their footnotes? Oh, they got a couple mm -hmm. footnotes? Okay, fine. So let me see. Okay, I'm going to go read Turton. I'm going to go read Bob Inc. I'm going to go into these guys. Okay, now let me let me think about, like, what do I believe philosophically? 
Uh, so let's go into that or, or psychology, right? right? Or this and that. And I, I see like continual fruit, even if that, even if that movement kind of collapsed or whatever, like, I, I think we're still out here and we're still trying to do yeah. work now. Yes. And we're, and we're, it's our turn. You know what it's I mean? Like we, we know the internet, we know, you know, discord, we know all these other things and we're just going to talk because we're not beholden. And if we say something wrong, uh, we don't get canceled by a, a major institution because who cares? Like I yeah. care, still, but yeah. I'm right. not in a position to really care as much. There's too much liability in being tied to an institution at this point. And the cost to your authenticity is so high. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess we do it. We got ideas and we got platforms, right? We got our own plat, dude. We own our own platforms. Yeah. That's why it doesn't matter. That's yeah. why no that's why all this is on us in a way. Yeah. Which is a great responsibility. Yeah. And and is exciting because it's on us over the next year or two to really create high quality resources, to edit those resources really well, to design those resources really well, to market them well, to make sure they're part of a larger pedagogical inter uh, you know, a user interface of online digital theological ecosystem that is supplying the church with some kind of uniform, yes. semi-ecumenical unity that says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, of course that guy's a nut. Look at that's nut over here. But of course we're bros, right? Like yeah. that, that's the kind of thing. That's we, his role. Like we, we, we know we expect that out of him. Yes. Right? Well, yes. I, I think it goes the other way too, dude. And this is something that's really hard for me is to go the other way and go, okay, there's also a role for the, uh, the like fundy who's like, I'm not moving. It's like, yeah, all right, there's a role for you, dude. And you're, we talked about with the dispies. That's why we're inerrantists or whatever still. So, 100%. There's more for you guys too. There's got to be space for those guys as well. You got to keep the fundies. That yeah. 100%, bro. Yeah. Because they keep you grounded in important ways. Really important yeah. ways. And, and so dude, hard. there are days I wake up as a fundamentalist. There are yeah. days I wake up as a fundamentalist obsessed with the epistemological question like, yeah, those people are all a bunch of idiots for not being Christians. You know, and, and, I, and I think that. And then, of course, the next day I'm like, God, where are you? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but uh but you know uh, um but that's that's the journey of course but yeah you have to accept both sides right you got to accept both sides um yeah. we, it's it's the uh, the overton window right is that question of what's acceptable discourse but but the problem isn't that you know because because the main question theologians will bring up as well if the overton window is too big now you're just letting heresy in but it's like yeah that's true but that's also not the problem we're really facing right now like, like you could, you could say like some of the issues we're facing are heresy, but they're not really like, we're not talking about how we classify the subsisting relations as subsistio realis minor, or subsistio yeah. realis mayor. Stretch that heresy, right? Like we stretched it. Van Hoos, <laughs> where he's like, dude, heresy and heterodoxy, right? Yeah. Heterodoxy, her heresy. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly right. And so. I think the lay Christians need to be instructed in how to think theologically yeah. again. Yeah, because what we have so far is, you know, it's like it's like a screenshot of a screenshot of a screenshot times infinity mm -hmm. of a screenshot. Uh, and that's what we're working with in terms of folk discipleship wisdom. Yeah. You know, and what we need is a fresh revitalization of the core biblical principles of what it means to interface with God and humankind in a responsible way. And we need to refresh that. We need to refresh it. And not, not because of what we ha used to have is untrue, but because of what we used to have has been um, has been encrusted and blocked yeah. by a lot of confusion and tautology and cliche and pastoral homonyms and all yeah. these kinds of things. You know, in a way, linguistic cleverness has become a substitute for accurate speech and true nuanced language. And all these times I see these people on Twitter, Christy isn't the first thing, he's the second thing, which you didn't even think about, did you? And it's like, dude, it's not about like finding some cool metaphor that sounds cool and it's like, wow, that's like, yeah. bro. You know, it's like bro theology. Yes. Um, and, and I just wanna be like, that doesn't mean anything about its truthfulness. Like yeah. that before you just used might be completely false. Like, yeah. like we, do, uh, uh, we need like a break on uh, a ban on alliteration and rhyming for just yeah, a, little yeah, a little bit of a break. Yeah. 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 And, and, and of course there's the other side too, which is like, what I feel, you know, it's so, so like, you know, it's too bad. Like the drama of doctrine didn't really get, I feel the, the attention it was due. I, I just don't think people really were like asking the question it was answering. And I think we're starting to now. 
Yeah. You know, and so the drama of doctrine as this theatrical theological model is one where everybody plays a part. Mm -hmm. And the metaphor, what, you know, so, so what's interesting is, so I, I always didn't like Van Hooser's drama of, you know, like, like many people, right? Most people read it. They're like, oh, really? It's the, the whole metaphor, really? And, and then they read it. And then, of course, I had read Balthazar's Theodrama, five volumes in college. So I had some context in 2006 when his book came out. Um, so I was, I was already kind of on that train. Uh, but, but then I, I hit a hard wall. And I realized that that I don't know if the metaphor itself can really do all the work it says it can do. And furthermore, I don't know if it's really ready. I mean, I don't know if the cake's quite baked through yet all the way, because, you know, we're already changing what's what in the metaphor and things are flipping around here and there. And so, my, you know, but that was my thought at the time. Now, then when I wrote my dissertation under Van Hooser, I found a word because Van Hooser was like, I'm not giving up drama. The play is the thing. I'm yeah. not doing it. And I'm like, all right. But then I wrote my dissertation and I, I found a word I wasn't willing to give up, which was autonomy. And that's when I understood the importance of the dramatic model. That's when I understood the importance of theodrama because it's not about whether you can do something other than dr the dramatic model and your theological, it, in the modeling of your theological methodology. It's, it's about whether drama is the thing you always have kind of have to come back to, which you do. And that is when I realized that that his Theodrama book, The Drama of Doctrine, was so critically important methodologically to the doing of theology, which is why I wanted my work to be sort of, you know, a, a reflection of that. I don't really employ explicitly any theodramatic concept, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, other than that so much of what I talk about really is theology in act. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But, uh, and so there is that certain affinity. And I and but but, you know, um, it <laughs> I studied with Van Hooser and it took me 10 years to understand why the drama of doctrine was important. Yeah. So how I just I don't know, maybe other people get it. Maybe they were just ahead of me. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I don't well, know. We gotta, we gotta do a whole episode on that sometime, dude, because I, I he he's can we should. And I want to I want him to be on because. Yeah. Because he's so good at this stuff, and who's yeah. so good at this stuff, man? Yeah. Well, he he like online more. He genu. I I'm I'm trying to get him on. Uh, I he, yeah. He said he will. We're just trying to figure out a date. But um, with with the authorial model and how that fits in to the the drama motif, like he's convinced yeah. me that it's 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 an analogy and and meaning like we can we're speaking literally of God though not univocally, right? Mm -hmm. And um. I know my philosopher friends are gonna, well. There's a core of university, no. and like, dude. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. he, he's he's so good with that. And something that 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 first put me on to him was in class, uh, like systematic one. I forgot God of the Gospel or something. He said when he wakes up in the morning, he 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 does this. He gets out of bed and says, "I'm a character in a story in a drama. What what am I going to play today? What's my role?" And he reminds himself of the role, and it's like. Mm -hmm. Bro, that's what the Stoics did. You, this is a way of life for you. Yeah, you're, cool, you're doing that, and I was like, okay, maybe there's something here. Yeah, I love that. Like he's I like, love oh, that. I'm living I it. Love that. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I see. That should be the book. Yeah. 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 No, well, man. Dude, we, we mentioned it. I want to give you a plug here. You got trauma of Woo! doctor. I hope Thank I you. Thank you. Yeah. That's your your dissertation, and I haven't made it past the uh, the intro because it's so good, and. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to move past. It's so good. I'm I'm gonna I'm getting into it more, but the preface, all that stuff is gold. I, I, I really <laughs> have enjoyed it so far, man. It's so good. Yeah. I, I told you in, in a text, but uh Paul man, this has been so huge. Thanks for thanks for coming on. We we went through a, a whole bunch of stuff, and if people like you at all, like this is gonna be their dream come true because we talked <laughs> about all your um and and if not, well, whatever, dude. Uh it, we whatever, dude. Good stuff anyways. I just got that tattoo, whatever, dude. No, that has to <laughs> not yet. Yeah, dude. Thanks so much for having me on, Parker. Man, I the first of many, and this was a long overdue one. And I canceled twice, three, four, five. No, don't you don't got to say that. Get out of here. Okay, okay, okay. I'm so sorry. I, you know, we moved to Tulsa. Yeah. You were so kind and understanding, but Parker's pen, dude. My wife has a Parker's Pensy sticker on her laptop that she's had ever since she had it, and every time I'm with her, Parker's Pensy is I right love there. That. So I've been wanting to come on this podcast for a long time. And also, also Molly, of course, has been wanting me to come on for a long time. So yeah. thank you for honoring me by hosting me here today, yeah. Parker. Your podcast is Razor's Edge, my friend. I will promote it. 
I will, I will do, I will, I will fight to the death for people to listen to this show. Thanks, man. Uh, and I love you, brother. I love the work. Love you, dude. Can can I um can I give some more plugs for for what you're working on? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so you got you got your website coming out. You got your dissertation. Uh, everyone check that out. It's the trauma of doctrine, new Calvinism, religious abuse, and the experience of God, which is insane because it's at the nexus of philosophy, theology, psychology. It's it's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, but can are are you able to talk about what Molly's about to do, or is that hush hush? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I should let her talk about it. Okay, I, should, I, so gotta come on too. I so appreciate you bringing it up. Yeah, she's got to come on as well, and we'll talk about that and stuff. Um, yeah. how, how about your your website? What's going on there? Yeah, dude, I'm so excited. So, you know, listen, I've always wanted to be a teacher. It's always what I've been best at. Mm-hmm. When I was at Moody, teaching philosophy was my favorite job ever. My lowest paying favorite job I've ever had in my life. It was the best. And after I got my PhD, I really had to go into marketing and business and worked in a tech company that serviced churches. Uh, and we built giving solutions for churches. And, and I, while I was there, I, we were able to go from 5,000 churches to 35,000 churches, which means we were processing the payments of over 10% of the tithes in America, which was amazing. And we got to see a lot of great giving and blah, 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 blah. But what I learned there was a lot um, of a lot of things I was already doing and learning about marketing. But uh, uh, but what it really gave me was a lot of the digital and uh, programming skills to be able to finally build exactly what it is I wanted to build for myself. Because I see a lot of people on Patreon. Oh, sorry. You're, I love Patreon. I'm so literally. literally right. you, you support me on Patreon, dude. It's okay. Close mouth holds no foot, as you they say. Whatever say. you want. You're you're Close a Patreon holds, supporter. No foot, as they say. But uh, but um, listen. Um, the the reason I'm building my own site and not going through a place like Patreon or something like that is because uh, I, I want to completely customize what this is to exactly what I want it to be. So mm-hmm. I have a vision for what I think is the simplest, most straightforward way from a person to go from a beginner to a master. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe you have to go through hours and hours and hours, weeks and weeks and weeks, years and years and years to master something. I think you can learn all you really need to know to get started at a really advanced level, feeling very competent about it. And of course you still have, you know, all the work ahead of you of actually putting that into practice and reading some books and seeing if those concepts and systems and methods and historical facts work for you in terms of putting the pieces together faster, doing something with all those pieces once they're put together. But what my website is, is it's going to be multiple courses on multiple levels of accessibility from beginner, intermediate and advanced and theology, psychology, and philosophy. I'm going to be teaching you all of the historical prim- uh, uh, the, the the historical concepts, all the way from the Stoics to Freud to Carl Jung to mm-hmm. Adam Adler, all the way in psychology up to Bessel van der Kolk in uh, in modern psychiatry. The new revisions in the DSM-5, what the DSM-5 is, how psychiatric categories work, how all of that in parallel relates to theology. And then of theology, of course, we're going to have full systematic theology, biblical theology. But what I'm most excited about, theological methodology courses. These are the tools. I'm going to be showing you exactly how I do theology. And then we're actually going to be doing theology. So we're actually going to be doing, so I have a class that we're going to have called Advanced Trinitarianism. And we're going to be doing some really fun work in the Trinity. And uh, of course, I published in Jets uh, twice in the Trinity. And what was so fun about that was getting that idea verified by so many scholars and saying, oh, this is the right direction. Yeah. And, and so picking up on a lot of verification I've gotten from sort of the top people in evangelical theology, I see, okay. I know how to do this. Yeah, I know how to do this. These answers work for me. Mm. This is great. And so what I'm doing is I'm teaching you what I do that has been verified by pretty much every major evangelical theologian I've interacted with about these ideas. My site's going to have a ton of great courses, beginner, intermediate, advanced on theology, philosophy, and psychology. It's going to be fantastic. And then, of course, I'm going to have applied studies and all those things, everything from the hero's journey in Carl Jung to Freudian theory to the history of these concepts, all the way through Alfred Alfred Adler to cognitive behavioral theory, modern psychiatry, the construction of the DSM-5, which is taking over our conception of the self nowadays. So, And also how all those things interface with theology. And of course, in theology, we're going to have classes on everything from books of the Bible to systematic theology, but it's all going to be through this lens that uses common categories to understand everything. So I'll teach you a method, and then we're going to use that same method 
to understand theology, psychology, and philosophy, and actually also business and marketing, if you can believe it. So, <laughs> so, so we're actually going to have all those courses. I'm about 85% done with the production of that. It's going to be live April 15th. I would recommend you go to paulmaxwell.co, click around, check it out, see if you like it. Um, I think right now I have a 50% discount running. After that, it's gonna be uh, $199 a year. But right now you can get it for 99 for the year. It comes with every course, every book, everything I publish live, something called the Paul Maxwell Digital Library, which is not as boring as it sounds. It's actually a really, really cool feature that I'm almost, almost as excited as I am about courses about the Paul Maxwell Digital Library. But then uh, you get a lot of benefits. Only Paul Maxwell, uh, all access members are able to get their answers, uh, our questions answered on the Paul Maxwell Today podcast. There's gonna be a live Facebook group uh, just for Paul Maxwell members. And the goal of this site is to create a community of healthy, self-paced, online adult theological learners. Man. That's what it is, man. Yeah. I want a healthy community of adults asking deep questions with good tools, getting great answers for themselves that are satisfying. Yeah. And maybe all those answers are different, and that's the fun of it, right? Yeah. But, yeah. But, um, but at the end of the day, the pursuit of truth with verifiably uh, you know, accuracy-achieving tools that's that that's the full Monty right there. That's everything. And that's yeah. what we'll be doing. But I'm structured in a way. So when I learned to when I learned to code about two and a half years ago for my as in preparation for doing this job, I all of the courses were like t under two hours and all the videos were like five minutes. And I loved it. Oh my gosh, I loved yeah. it. Because at the end of the day, you don't have to like shorten content. It's just about the package. Right, it's just like about where you slice this beginning and that ending, and then start and pick up again. Yeah. So, so, so much of learning is about deliverables. It's about the packaging. It's about the the the. Hey, look, look. Does does this make sense? Is it is it that is where how what is it this what what is it right? It's it's so, so much of it is trial and error, and so much of it is the geography, the topography you know, of knowledge. And so that that's one of the core, just to give you a little hint of what the pedagogical, what the educational experience will be like on the site. This is something I, that's become so impressed upon me is that the hippocampus, as you may have just have read, mm -hmm. is one of the most primitive aspects of the, of the brain. And of course, stores our spatial map so that when we think, when we build our theological reasoning on top of our spatial, our spatial reasoning. So the frontal lobe yeah. actually depends upon the hippocampus rather than the other way around, which said theology is typically done. We are able to think spatially first and foremost, which is how we are meant to think. It's how mm. we're wired to think about theology, not linguistically, but semiotically. Mm. And because of that, um, the geography is the most irreducible metaphor of what isness is of what a thing to be that thing is is where it is and how it's functioned there in a time relative to another thing in another place in another time is relevant to us in our place in our time and however you draw the lines of that or the dimensions of that or the angles of that is going to inform how you use that term in the future subconsciously yeah. it always will because at the end of the day when you're done thinking about theology whatever you got that's what you're going to use next yeah. time you need that concept so where you land has big implications for where you go mm. what we're doing on my site is saying i'm going to try to teach you the methods that can give you confidence to pick up the pen to pick up the bible and maybe even pick up a theology book and say i know what i'm doing and yeah. I do this, not because I'm inventing it all, not because I'm coming up with Christianity, mm -hmm. not because I'm inventing the truth, but because I'm trusting the promise of God in the offer of theology, that it's a good faith offer, and that this challenge will always be worth it. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm doing on the site. And if people like it, if they know who I am, they can Google me, they can walk, you know, they can watch around, click around if they like what they see. I would really love for them to join. And of course, the best thing about the site is that yes, it's a community of people going through it all, but they're all going through these different courses at different paces. And of course, different cohorts will be going through at different times, but you don't have to be part of a cohort. You can just go through any, mm. any 
course. And again, you're not buying courses. It's a single membership. Yeah. It's access to every course. That's awesome. Every, there's only one product. You either, you're either a member or you're not. If you're yeah. not, you don't get any courses. If you are, you get every course, every book, everything. And yeah. you can download it. You can watch it. You can do whatever you want. So check it out. Yeah. I'll be there if, yeah. if if this show hasn't dissuaded you already. Well, <laughs> no, that's awesome, dude. Thanks for that pitch. And and uh, for 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 those listening, like, dude, I I do think like the the new the new Calvinists, right, who are looking for for to be fed more, like mm -hmm. they're gonna flock to this, man. I'm excited for that. For mm -hmm. me, uh, like, I want to learn some of that stuff too. But also, like, dude, for the rest of the content creators out there like you're leading the way for us. And so the reason I'm on Patreon is because I don't have those tools that you're working on, dude. So, so you're oh, building. I'm going to hook you up. I'm going to hook you up, bro. Yeah, Let's man. I love that. I love, yeah. I love that about you. And you, you open up new doors where we go, Oh, that's possible. We can do that. Oh, all right. Well, that's cool. Now let me, now I can just even begin thinking about that. Yep. So yep. yeah, dude, we really, we love you. We appreciate you. Thanks for, for all you're doing, man. I love you, man. This is fantastic. Thanks yeah. for having me on the show, brother. Yeah. yeah it's been awesome. All right. So, we can talk about this a little bit more. Uh, Lord willing, we're going to. Paul's going to come on a bunch. It's going to be fantastic. Oh, yeah. For now, it's going to have to do it. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God.